Ancient Technology with Ben from Uncharted X. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. We're actually doing a swap cast tonight, but we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Airbus Plateau. And we are joined by Ben from Uncharted X. Uh, and, uh, well, I guess he's, um, he just told us that he's not an actual podcast. He's a YouTuber. <laughs> He's a YouTuber. Yes, you guys are the podcast. We're the podcast. But you have a podcast. You are professional podcasters. <laughs> Te- technically, yes. I guess I do. Yeah. When's the next episode, bro? I yeah, refresh uh, my so feed, I'm, my Uncharted X mate. feed every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. From the last episode that was like a year ago? Yeah. Um, every day. Yes. Well, I, hey, I, I am book. Hey, we've been talking about this. I'm booking Kyle. I, yeah. I, wanted, I want you guys one-on-one. Yeah. On these podcasts, gonna... because I've got I've got shit to say, you know, and I and I want a, I want an audience to say it with. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. I think I think Kyle could get on board with me, you know, I talking so. mad shit about a few things. Yeah, oh, I'm in. I'm in. Good. Yeah, I can't wait to listen to this. <laughs> it's gonna happen. New podcast. It's gonna happen on the Uncharted yeah. X feed that I've been refreshing <laughs> every day for a year. It's gonna be I'm neat, stoked bro. to hear that uh, you got a special guest coming on. I yeah. did. It'll be episode thirty, I believe. <laughs> yeah. What are you guys up to? Like six million? Like six hundred? Six hundred? We just passed. Uh, we did uh, episode three hundred one. Three hundred one. Yeah, that's so, right. So now yes, we're. What is this? This is this is episode three hundred six right yep, here. Yep. Like three hundred six yeah, minus one, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be well, three hundred five episodes. Episode number right. three hundred six. Yeah. I do like your persistent doggedness in sticking to the. We don't celebrate except except it's not. It's not 200, it's no, 201. It's 201, yeah. yeah. That's right. Yep. 201 yep. is the actual 200th episode. So yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Longest running gag joke in podcasting, yep. probably. It's fantastic. <laughs> Six years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you make a huge mistake in episode one, you're kind of stuck <laughs> forever after that. Yep. It's now written in stone. That's right. You can no longer do the first episode. <laughs> it's a... It's, yeah, that's it. So uh, you've been doing all kinds of stuff since the last time we had you on. You were back in Egypt. You've been working on yeah. this vase stuff, which is fantastic. Like, if anyone hasn't seen the recent Uncharted X videos on the vases, you guys have to go watch this stuff. I mean, like, really breaking ground. Thank uh, you. Like, absolutely, you know, it's – people are always – you know, we get emails, we get comments, of course, in the Discord, and people are like, I want – I want answers to this, or at least to some of this in my lifetime. Like, will will the mm-hmm. can we move? You know, the 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 thinking here a little bit, and like, I think that you're you're actually doing that with this with this work. Yep, I, I'm reporting on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm lucky enough to be reporting on it. I, I mean, I'm not. I can't take credit for the work. I, I do want to always make sure that um, you know, the credit goes to the guy Adam Young, uh, who who and and Alex Dunn. Uh, who particularly Adam Young really has been on this bandwagon for like 10 years or so. He's, I mean, a lot of people have been right. Everybody I've, and this is why it was so validating for me when they reached out. It's because like a lot of people have looked at these vases and these artifacts and said, there is something there like visibly you can see there's elements of precision. I mean, it's just absolutely mind blowing stonework. This, you know, incredible like perfection and symmetry and balance. And there's uh, these thin materials that are, extremely hard stone and it's just how do they do it it's amazing and wouldn't it be great if we can analyze it and so a lot of people have been on that bandwagon but adam young was actually the guy who 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 set out and had the resources to to try and do something about it like he he did have a deliberate plan of going out and tried to acquire the most precise and best examples of these vases that he could and he did eventually get his hands on what i term the og vase the yeah. original gangster, original granite, whatever. Yeah. But the OG vase that all the initial work was done on, and he's he's been out there trying to get that scanned and analyzed. And eventually, you know, he went on a trip with Chris Dunn and met Alex Dunn, and they took him a couple of years to kind of put all the pieces together. And then Alex brought in Nick Sierra, and of course, they're professional metrologists. They work in the aerospace industry. They're familiar with the, you know, the uh, all of the, the CAD and the geometric tools and the GD&T stuff that, that they do on the daily in, you know, in their daily lives, and they were able to analyze the results of the scan from this initial vase, and it's just, it's, 
the conclusions started coming. Um, it was mind blowing. And of course, you know, Chris, I think Chris Dunn put them on, put Alex on the me and said, well, you know, I think they, they did it and they couldn't get any attention on it. And they're like, well, we need an outlet for it. And I guess I'd, I'd yeah. had a relationship with Chris Dunn for a while and uh, they connected with me. And I was like, this is fantastic. Like, this is exactly what I've been calling for for years. Like yeah. you guys have done the thing that as you said, like if we want to move the needle forward, we need to, or we want to move the conversation forward. We need to apply ourselves and our technology and actually investigate this stuff and try and put some metrics and measurements around it. And that's exactly what they did. And yeah, it was, I was so, it just, it personally was valid, you know, just validating, I guess. Right. It's like this, yeah. uh, this theory and this thought that I've had for so long as have many other people. And I was like, shit, here's the proof. Like here's, solid evidence that this is exactly what we're looking at like it's really not something that's possible by hand we're looking at real evidence of sophisticated machining and, and technology use that comes from some of the earliest periods of history and you know it's it's verifiable and you can repeat it and here's the model anyone can look at it so yeah I was so happy when they contacted me and it's just it's it's sort of taken on on its on a life of its own since then and and we put that out and their timing was impeccable because it was, I think, two or three months before I went on Rogan. Yeah, um, that's right. And I was like, man, you, you guys have timed this well because now I can mention it on that platform. I, I probably didn't have enough context. I couldn't talk about it as well as I would have liked to, uh, as certainly as much as I can now and understanding all the things now. But that year since then has been insane in, in what's happened and what the opening this up to the world and making it, what, what do you want to call it, open source? It's been just an incredible response and and we've just yeah it's just it's grown a life of its own from that from there on so the there's to me it looks like you know that the conversation has moved because of this from these were done by hand by the yeah. you know what's the name of the um the the typical depiction that they show uh at sakara yeah doesn't have a name. yeah so i don't know if they have a name for it um but it's yeah. I mean, look, the, the the typical explanation for these is given they're pre dynastic and old kingdom is there's no use of the wheel. Yeah, you know these these are done with grinding essentially like they they use crooked sticks with a flint like weights on the end of a, of a crooked stick with a flint tip. Right, and they're rubbing on it with sand and banging on it with rocks. That's literally the the technology level that. Uh, is used to explain these, and mm. and in fact, there are scenes on the walls where you can see Egyptians doing that stuff. But, yes, that's what I'm. You talking know what about. it 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 matches. Yeah, it's at Saqqara, like third dynasty, and but it matches. It, you know, as if you watch my content on it, I think it. I think that exactly matches the alabaster industry that we see. Right. That was that was pretty much given rise from about this the third fourth dynasty um, after these. You know these vases. These vases had been in 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 existence for for a long time before that. Like they go back almost tens of thousands of years. I mean, we have examples at nine, ten thousand BC, even as far as fourteen or fifteen thousand BC, of uh, of burials that they they found these sort of artifacts in there. But certainly, a lot of them attributed to you know first, second, third, fourth dynasty, or old kingdom, and then after that they sort of peter out. And you have this alabaster industry of these of these definitely handmade, definitely not as precise. Much softer stone, beautiful work, but but totally producible by these primitive methods. And in fact, this is one of the things that I did when I was in Egypt last time, as I was filming at one of the alabaster shops in Luxor. They are still making these things, still making these alabaster vases with the exact same techniques oh, yeah. that they were using three, four, five thousand years ago, uh, just with steel tools now. And like you can go to these alabaster stores and you can get the nice machined lathe made alabaster vessels but they also you can buy these handmade ones and they they very much match the handmade alabaster vessels from ancient egypt right but that's what that scene on the wall is depicting but but what happens in i guess the mainstream story is they go well see this is just how they made all this stuff yeah exactly yeah and then it just doesn't make any sense it's impossible so basically so these Aside from the provenance thing that the, the mm. these measurements have shown, so then people started saying, "Well, as you know, it's, it's easy to do with a lathe, right? Like I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. I've seen that. Like, oh, it's, it's simple with a lathe, right? With a lathe, yeah. But now it's nah. the, some of the measurements <laughs> that at least were taken recently by. Uh, I think I gathered this from watching your your video. The ancient precision confirmed uh, mm -hmm. was basically saying that 
the section of the vase between the lug handles is also very precise. You're right. And you can't do that with a lathe. Well, it you, you can't do any of it. With, it dep- and, and it's not just any old lathe either. So, we, we, you know, we're, in terms of outright numbers, I mean, we have examples with a number of these vases now where you're talking, you know, one and a half, two, three thousandths of an inch. Right. Like that's and again, we I do the demonstration in the video. Or Alex does where it shows you a you know a single human hair is about two thousandths, between two yes. and three thousandths of an inch thick. So, yeah. you know, this is this is a tiny distance. If you want microns, it's like twenty five microns is about a thousandth of an inch, roughly. Um, it's pretty close enough, right? A single micron is about the size of a bacteria. So we're talking pretty small. So some people get all worked up about the metric versus bananas thing, but whatever. <laughs> we, we, we're in America. The tools are in Imperial. Deal we're with it. We're using bananas. Yeah. I, we're using bananas. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I even put that in the video and I'm like, mate, get your jokes out because yeah, yeah. for sure there's people bitching and moaning about it. I'm like, oh, whatever. <laughs> it's going to happen. But I know math is hard. You, you can't, mm-hmm. the conversion's really hard, but you can, you try me, try, try. You'll be okay. Yeah, um, no, it's your job. It's You're my, making that's the right. video. It's my job. You God make damn it. The conversions. <laughs> I must repeat every measurement in both systems. <laughs> yes, yes, we actually we got that in reverse right. for the Gobekli Tepe video. People were like, I don't know what a meter is. Can you tell me yeah, what this is in feet? <laughs> 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 Look it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I yeah. get the same thing. I try, man. I, I did it in a lot of videos and just all this many bananas, you know? And it's just yes. like, oh, yeah. Christ. But. <laughs> Anyway, my point is is that it's not, it's not just any lathe. Like to get that degree of precision, it's not like some fucking wooden lathe contraption, right? Yeah, where some dudes like strap some shit together with twine and sticks and wood and a spinning table that he's just just sort of wobbling around all over the place. You you need and and to do this stuff in granite like that. No, and not just granite, but you know, so I, all these other types of stone, diorite and things that are much harder than granite. Yeah. I'm working I mean, with you... a guy right now who is uh, used to machine parts for uh, NASA. Yeah, and I was talking to him about this, and he was like, "You can't, you can't lathe granite. You have hmm. to grind it. Like, yes, you can right. mount it on a lathe and you can spin it, but you're not going to be cutting it with uh, any normal. It apart. Yeah, it would shatter. Yeah, especially right. if you get the thinness. So he he's like, it's it's got to be a a grinding action using the la- so circular. you have to have some kind of tool that's actually just grinding away at it yeah like, and not he's a cutting talking, tip yeah not like a carbide cutting tip or yeah. anything like that but he's you know he's talking about uh, obviously modern lathing yeah like that you yeah. would lathe like a, a metal tool or something like that yeah and uh, yeah it's it, yeah go ahead no, I was going to say, I mean, it's just, that's the point. That is one of the big points. It's like people admitting that, and, and I, I even, you know, I even had a discussion with, um, shit, I'm going to forget his name again, uh, Irvin, Irving Finkel, who was at the Megalithomania conference recently. He's he's the curator of the Middle Eastern collection at the British Museum. Famous guy. You've probably seen him on YouTube. Long, gray hair with a ponytail, big beard. He mm. does like the, there's a chess, he plays the ancient game of whatever the chess precursor game was and the... He's all over YouTube. Okay. Interesting guy. Hugh knows him and uh, Hugh Newman knows him. And I was hanging out with Hugh in the UK and Hugh just like cold calls him, gets a hold of him and says, and then hands the phone to me. And it's <laughs> like, I, I'm like, thanks, Hugh. Like I'm now I'm like, hey, bro. And I'm trying to explain to him the, <laughs> like what we're doing. And and you just get this sense. He's like, well, yeah, anything that's that's turned on a lathe, it's going to be precise. It's kind of the pushback. And I'm not, I'm, I don't want to argue with him. What I want is to get into the museum and to be able to look at some, you know, scan some of these artifacts. I'm trying to have yeah. a relationship. Say, look, let me send you a written a breakdown of what we're doing and what we're proposing and this sort of stuff. And I wasn't going to argue with him, but I just got immediately understood that people don't understand precision, and and even people that have spent their life working with in archaeology and they're not really they're not precision engineers they don't understand the nature of precision and what we're looking at when we're talking about a couple thousandths of an inch in materials like granite because yeah you, you just just people admitting that oh if, okay it was turned on a lathe yeah that's not sufficient because you in order to get those results in something like granite you have to have ultra precise and solid bearings rods yeah you know the the screws, like all so, the components of this lathe, like massive metal, super strong. You have to just even be able to grip a, a piece of granite and keep it stable enough where you can exact enough force on that thing to carve it or grind it. I mean, that's all of those things take 
the very best kind of machinery that we have today. This isn't something that you can strap together with bits of wood right. in a backyard. Like this is industrial precision machinery. It would take our some of our best machinery to get this result today. That's and somewhat we, like that's that's what the it's almost like a paradox that that is precision. Because in order to get a certain yeah. type of precision, you have to have some already type of precision. Yeah. So if you want you if you be... want to if you want to talk about a bearing, you have to have a very precise circular object. Yeah. And in order to get that, you have to have precision in order to cut that. That's right. So like yeah, you, it, you got to make something spherical. You have to make spherical <laughs> bear. I mean First. even if it was just a sleeve or a bushing type bearing, they the, the shaft and the bearing itself have to be precisely aligned and to do that you already have to have precision. Yeah. So it just yeah. keeps going back and this this is one of the things that really struck us when we got into this was like how did this even start? <laughs> like how did how do you start? And and the funny thing is in the modern age Precision starts with basically rubbing three stones together. Yeah. Yeah, lapping, right? Yes. Um, yeah. And, yeah. That's, and, and that's just wild to me. That's like, really, <laughs> it comes down to that. But then you have to work off of that and to move forward. And you can't and, move forward without that. That's right. That's right. And more than that, it's one of the reasons why I insist, and I've done videos on this premise, is that there is a relationship between precision and function. Yeah. Like you do not develop precision unless there there is a need for like the functional return it gives you. Like it's too expensive to develop precision. And this is true for our modern world. Like yeah. Yeah, precision starts. I mean, we started developing precision machining techniques in order to make naval cannons shoot straight. That's what I was because, gonna say. It all comes down to how do you manage an explosion inside of something? Yes. Right. Yeah, steam That's, engine like this. Yes. Yeah. The bigger the explosion you want to make, the more precise this thing <laughs> needs to be. It needs to be. <laughs> yeah, because they, they used to cast what they would do. They'd cast these damn cannons in steel or bronze or whatever, and then they'd shoot them while they were hot. Yeah. And they'd, all right, they, that's yeah. the way it's going to shoot from now on. It's just like, <laughs> yep. it's inaccurate as F, you know, yeah. like all yeah. over the shop. And then someone figured out, well, maybe we can, if we actually figure out and we can make a straight hole on this thing, yeah. maybe we can make it shoot more accurately. And it turns out and you stick this thing on a water wheel and they make a primitive lathe and they grind it out and they, they make a barrel. Yeah. And that's where it starts. And then it gets in, it, it extends into, you know, watchmaking, timekeeping, which gave us the ability to measure longitude uh, and navigate better. Um, this wasn't a thing that happened until the turn of the what the 18th century. The yeah. James Cook's second voyage of discovery was the only the time when we had enough accurate time keep time time pieces accurate enough where we could actually navigate with longitude as well as latitude. Yeah, because before that we would have to run down an easting on a westing. Right, you'd you'd go to where you needed to be on the latitude, and then you'd go straight east or west because yeah. you couldn't you couldn't measure east or west before this. Yeah, and what was and the... of course that's very inaccurate. That's very inefficient when it comes to traveling yeah, across the ocean. Especially, yes, especially when you're sailing. Yeah, what was the accuracy that they needed? They it was something like the timepiece had to lose less than a second per month. Something yeah, like something that. like that. Which to is, get accurate longitude. Yeah, which is you know which is like horribly inaccurate compared to what we have today. But that was, right. you know, like the, the kind of clocks that they had back then, especially if, you know, you're trying to run a water clock or something with a swinging pendulum <laughs> on a ship. Yeah, right. That's swinging, <laughs> you know. So you're like, no, we can't use any of these tools that we've been using to keep time, like water dripping out of something or something swinging. You have to build something else, yeah. right? And uh, yeah, so the, you're right. The, there was time and precision in time as well. But most of it yeah. was about explosions. Yeah, well, then steam, uh, the industrial uh, yeah, engines, engines, steam engines. How do I make something explode to and keep it inside contain this pressure? Thing, yeah. yeah, right. And we need these flat surfaces, and we need bearing. And now we need to contain all that power and pressure. Yeah, and that and that's a, leads you down the path of like, well, we need to get better at this because there's a functional return on the back of it, so we'll spend the money to do it. And you end yes. up that's a right. couple hundred years later doing, you know, what seven nanometer processes in silicon. Yeah, making you know integrated circuits with literally millions and millions of transistors in them. So we can put the fucking things in washing machines and dishwashers and, and, right. and that, you that's, know, that's the other part of the it point. How is that, our modern world? Is that you're, you're saying that precision follows function or a necessity of a type of function. Mm -hmm. And yet we have these vases well, that don't appear to have a function mm -hmm. unless it's a Do message they? or it's just because because one of the other options is once you I have think... precision for some other reason, then whatever you make. 
with those machines is going to be precise to, right. the, to the tolerances of those machines. Yes. So the vases yeah. could be just artifacts of the precision level of the machinery of the time. Or the function could be that they wanted to encode some like like precise mathematics. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I I'm the sort geometry. of yeah, I'm sort of fascinated by the concept of of that these objects are actually not their very precise work. In other words, because mm. they're art objects or decorative objects, they're making them precise. But in the same way, we might make a like a trash can or a poster, a, a poster or a mo you know even a modern vase. Didn't you guys measure a modern vase in the in the recent video? Yeah. Somebody he went and brought one. It's very yeah, nice vase. and polished on the outside, the marble one, but the interior was like whatever, right? They didn't it's care garbage, so man. much. And you know, so you think about like when we're making objects like that, you know, something like this, you want it to be precise enough to look good, but it just needs to be, it just needs to look good, you know. But if you're, but yeah. but then you also have your your machines, and so the machine in your factory has this certain level of precision. That's the machine you use, and that's what you end up with on the object. But you don't maybe yes. use your most precise machines to make stuff like this. Well, yeah, I have a, I have a couple points to make on this. I know the exact point you're making, and okay. I've thought about the same thing. So, firstly, you're right in that once you develop precision and your manufacturing system, and given this is a, I think there was a manufacturing system. This yeah. isn't just dudes banging on stuff with rocks and rubbing on it with sticks and shit. Um, the, once the manufacturing system can delivers that precision, that's what you get. That's why our to, like our toasters and our yeah car panels and everything today is are, are very accurately made. And they don't need to be, but the the stuff gets designed in CAD and it gets executed on a you know through a computer and the system just punches it out and delivers it and it's within whatever the tolerance is tiny these tiny little tolerances. It's very precise. It doesn't need to be. Mm -hmm. It's what the manufacturing system delivers. So. Can you explain that stuff this way? I think so. I think there's a there's a reasonable explanation. I I do use that explanation. I think for the statues, because there's been some work done on the statues and the symmetry and the faces of the Ramsey statues and the giant artifacts, which I also think are probably the um, the output from these types of manufacturing systems. And you really can't argue that those statues are functional. Right. They're clearly artwork. They're representational. They're you know, symbolic, all these things, but they're very precise and they seem symmetrical. And at least as far as we've the the scanning and the analysis that's been done to, so far, I think that's the result of these manufacturing systems. Now, the vases are a little different. I I'm not sure what to make of them just yet. I I think there's a there's a it's interesting that they seem to encode so much data. So one of the results of you know, if you've watched my I have this tale of two industries and I cover the vase thing a few times and I've talked about it at conferences, but the depth of sacred geometry that seems to be in these things, this mathematical system that's behind them that is based on radians and pi and phi and sort of these universal principles and constants uh, that that encode our reality. I think it's it's it is it is communicating this information to us through time, and it's. I don't know if it's deliberate or if that's just a result of the math system they were using. Yeah. So that was just the basis for their very the system and everything they did encoded those things. And that's going to be a really interesting point when we, if we can continue to analyze more artifacts, are we seeing this radial traversal pattern? Are we seeing the same significant ratios of pi and phi and you know the golden ratio? All these all these aspects that we found in the vases, I suspect we'll and we've seen them in multiple vases, so we might see them in multiple artifacts. We're certainly seeing some indications of that just based on looking at some of the old work with, with this new lens now. Yeah. But are they functional? Are they artistic? I don't know. I, I think there's a chance that these vases might have actually been functional. I don't think they're all vases. I think there's too many of them. I think there's a good chance they were functional. They might have been, I don't know, look, resonates. I don't know what they were. It's it's one of those, it's that, it's that I get into this zone of like, well, how do you define a technology that you don't understand or you haven't discovered yet? It just is this magical realm of speculation, right? We'll know more about technology and science in a hundred, a thousand years. So we can, from that deduct that there are realms of technology and science that we don't understand today. And I think the explanation for some of these stuff, maybe even the pyramids, maybe the sites, maybe the, these ancient things we're looking at might actually, the answers might exist in those realms 
that are outside of our understanding right now. And yeah. so it makes it really hard to speculate. But when I look at the vases, I go, okay, there, there seems to be a consistency in terms of form. There's two or three shapes and general size, general shapes, the rounder ones, the hourglass shape ones, the taller ones. Scale varies up and down. The lug handles are really interesting to me because I look at those and you can imagine and forget the holes in the lug handles. I think the holes were added later. Most of the vases that have lug handles don't actually have holes in them. I was going to say, if the holes added later makes yep. it. I think so. I think yeah, so that, as well. That people, first scan, people, I mean, the holes aren't even, the holes are just yeah. so out of whack from yeah. being straight. It just, so just, somebody see that made on, them into vases. Is that the idea? Yes. Well, I think they, they were definitely used as vases. Yeah. They whether or not like, they were initially vases, I don't know. Because some of these like vases, like, vases. like the ones up here I've got up here, they're upside down because you can't actually stand them up the other way around. Like they have it, they're on like yeah, a point. There's point some that are balanced the really well, but this one up here yeah. next to this pyramid has a point on it. So it's a it's an upside down vase. But the lug handles are interesting because I'd look at those and go, is that are they would that function as a cam lock? Imagine you stuff that into something yeah. and twist it. It's like a cam lock, and that might function that way. Are they resonators? Are they, are they, is there some other I, I can imagine a realm of possibility where they are functional. Maybe they're just parts of a bigger system, a bigger machine, and they were all dispersed and taken apart, then found by these, you know, Mesolithic and Dude. Neolithic peoples and insulators dispersed. Ins whatever. Yeah, no, I, I mean, know, I, man. I'm not I just... saying the vases are, but remember the glass insulators? People used to collect yeah. these. And it's like, I remember seeing these when I was a kid. I have no idea what these are. This is not a cup. What is this? <laughs> it's this weird. It's round. You can't, you turn it over. It's got threads yeah. on the inside. It's got these really weird, it, they're so strange looking to somebody who, yeah. would, like if you didn't know about electricity well, and that it, they might've been used as insula like glass insulators yeah. on electrical wires, like these are very strangely shaped, shaped things. Objects. Yeah. Holes in. So I, that's, that's cool. I like the idea of cam lock. Uh, yeah, I, it, it looked that, and that I just think it's it's pure speculation, and I sure. I recognize that. And I try not to speculate too hard about this stuff because it, it's like at that point it's it's pure imagination. But well, that's why yes. you're coming on our show. This is where yeah, you do yeah. all the speculation. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm gonna write a book. I'm gonna speculate the fuck in the book. So. Yeah. All right. Good. I'm not comparing but, them to insulators as, as though electrical. I'm just talking about the I got like, the idea that the, you would see. I that get form. it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the the example of you. I'm probably used it on your show before too. It's like this thing, right? Look, you and I know what this is. Yeah. Like we can look at this and this this black piece of plastic or glass that if you bang it with a hammer, it's going to break. I mean, you and I, we, we all have the context to understand what this is because we yeah. know what touch screens are and wireless networking, cell phones, microphones, video cameras, all this stuff that, that makes up in our head what a cell phone does and what it is or smartphone. Yeah. But you go back in time, not even that long ago, and you show somebody something like this that's not powered on or anything and they're just going to, what is that thing? It's like a shiny piece of rock. Right glass and you just don't have the context to to understand what it is and that's it's possible i think that when we look at some of these artifacts and these sites that we're in the same position we don't have the context to truly understand what these things are and then maybe once we get that context we understand what you know cell microphones and wireless networking and all those things are yeah there you go um we might have the we might be able to uh -oh. put them into a context and understand it better but we certainly won't be able to do that if we don't look at them with an open mind and investigate them to the limits of our capability, right? If we just go, it's all ceremonial, it's all just artistic, it's just accidental that they're precise. We we know what they were doing. They're just these are just canopic vessels or vases for oils and ointments and shit, and that's it. We're never gonna learn about them. It's just you have to kind of open up your mind and go, let's actually figure it out. Let's look at the the engineering behind them. And I think the same thing goes for the boxes and the pyramids and all this stuff. We should yeah. just be open-minded about it and try and figure it out. I wonder if, uh, you know, if this is, if, I mean, could the boxes, like if we can figure out in some way what these are for, like are all these objects similar, have similar function, like the boxes in yeah. the therapy, it might be large versions Maybe. You know, I don't know. I mean, they're not, obviously they're not round, but yeah, these could be resonators. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's Chris Dunn's theory, right? The Heimholtz resonators yeah. are big ones and yeah. they do, and they do scale. Uh, some of these vases certainly scale, but these are down at a smaller size. I, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 
I don't know. I mean, I, it's I get crazy. The, they make them like thimble sized. Yeah, that's the other thing. They I was do. Say. They, they have thumbnails. These tiny exactly. Ones. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, went and looked that, at those that again. That doesn't make any sense as a, you know, because in the standard model, they're like, oh, as yeah, these, are, these right? are for yeah. grave goods. Yeah. Like, what are you going to put in there? His fingernails? <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly right. Yeah, it's right. This yeah. little tiny freaking thimble size. <laughs> vase. Symbolic. I also would love to. Vase. It would be, Fuck you know, you, you've you talked about that one that was found in the grave, the Mesolithic era grave, yeah. 14, 9,000, 14,000. Where are mm. those now? Like, can those be traced? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you'd have to go. I mean, we. I do want to. And in fact, in February, when we go, uh, I think we are going to go. You guys haven't been to the Nubian Museum in Aswan yet. I don't think so. Uh, We're going to go. That's where those pictures are for the okay. for Toshka. Okay. People get bent out of shape about Toshka. I've had some people like, I can't find any reference to what you're talking about with Toshka. Like, we're going to go. It's because there's. There's images that it's at the Aswan Museum. Like that's the records for that. It's not online, and and, and they might we might be able to track some of that other stuff down. Yeah, that would be great. But Tosca's kind of an outlier, and it's it's one example of many. Like even Adam Young, the guy I was talking about before, he's got a vase, a big one that's really nice, and it was it's the provenance on it is is perf is is impeccable, but it was brought out of Egypt by the Czechoslovakian ambassador in the late eighteen hundreds. And it was found in a site that was later carbon dated to like nine or ten thousand BC. Yeah. So you're still. I mean, this is a big vase. He has it. He has the vase, and there's there's no question about where it came from. And it's yeah. not made in any modern times because it was literally taken by the Czechoslovakian ambassador in the late 1800s. So the provenance question has been solved. Basically oh, I, I think so. Yeah. Look, I, I I mean, my look, we we definitely wanted to address it because people have asked about it. I. I think logically you can work through the provenance question uh, just by looking at what that vase represents, how precise it is, how difficult it is to make that in granite, like how how expensive it would have been. And given that it has, so the original, the OG vase that we looked at, the very first vase goes back to the 1980s. We, ha we have, and and I, I go to some length to try and explain like this is the, yeah, the one you're holding. Yeah. This is the nature of the antiquities market, right? Like not everything is like perfectly provenanced because it, it Egypt gets involved. It, you know, museums want to take it. Like stuff yep. was taken when it shouldn't have been taken at times. Yeah. <laughs> Other times, a lot of stuff is legit, but some of it is like has come through, you know, not, not always legal means over the last several hundred years. And it's in these family collections that turn up in estate sales and whatever else. So... But even in the eighties, like just to, there's, there's very few people, and, and it's 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 a very open question to whether or not people would have actually been able to make that degree of precision in granite in the eighties, and at what cost? Like it would have it burns out tools. It would be tremendously expensive, and in the eighties, trying to sell that sort of stuff onto the antiquities market it wouldn't have been worth very much. I mean, honestly, since we've done these vase videos, I know I've driven up the, like these videos have driven up the price of vases. Yeah. <laughs> you can just ask Matt, like the guy's been buying them. He's like, God damn it. Like he talks to these antiquities dealers like, yeah, we're getting so many inquiries about vases now. Like all the prices <laughs> have doubled or tripled for these vases that are on the market. Dang it. People are generally more interested in like statues or faces, like the hieroglyphs and shit. These plain unadorned vases weren't particularly interesting for a lot of people. So they weren't very expensive. Damn, and we missed out on an extra made a strategy. huge mistake by <laughs> me, not I buying vases did. before oh. publishing these videos. <laughs> yeah, fuck me. I've I've kicked my own ass so hard over the last year because of that. I'm like, I so I so should have bought a few vases and then tried to sell them because we did. I, I would have made two, three times my easy. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm so stupid, and I thought I didn't think about it, but that's what happened. And well, you're a terrible, terrible grifter. Ben. Yeah, yeah. I am. you're really right. bad yes. at it. I'm grifting. You're no good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm try apparently, according to my critics, I'm in it for the money. Yeah, and I'm just grifting and making this shit up. But damn, if I miss some opportunities <laughs> along the way of how to do that, you know, to grift right. on people. Yeah. Oh, uh, let's take a. This is fantastic. Let's take a break and come back. We'll we'll keep talking about the vases. Be right, right. back. Hit it now. 
All right, we're back. You didn't stop recording, right? No. Okay, all right. <laughs> Go. We're back, folks. Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Uh, are we continuing with Vase Talk? We can. I'm well, fine. yeah, I wanted, I wanted to get a little deeper did into Did they the... hold flowers or <laughs> did they hold explosions? Did you see the... Uh, some of the um, they held pencils. Did you not see the Photoshop that some of the guys in my Discord did? Of me? Uh, no. I have to show it. I can show it if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You pull it's it pretty up. funny. Yeah. I'll pull it up. But you, you guys talk about the flowers first, and then Kyle wants to know if they held flowers. <laughs> Is that what the vases are for? Does. You think maybe you need something well, that's precise okay. for flowers? So I like this. The, I, I I'm not going to talk about flowers. I don't know what they held. You could put anything you want in them. But beers. Yeah, I mean, hey, I drank when mm, I, big ones. This was, sure, this was a gift from old uh, Aaron. Yep, and uh, immediately I drank wine out of it. <laughs> it's a good wine vessel. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I saw that. Um, but this radial transversal pattern. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> just a yeah. just a thought on this radial transversal pattern. If I have this correct, because I this is. You know, I've had to struggle to try to understand this. Sorry, I'll, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing it because I do want I do want to talk about the radial traversal traversal uh, pattern too. He's showing for those of you who are listening. He's showing uh, pictures that people memes that people made of uh, the ghost, the famous scene in Ghost where yeah, he's, where helping, he's, he's helping he's helping her do the pottery on the pottery yeah. wheel on the potter's yeah. wheel. Except it's Patrick Swayze behind Patrick me. Patrick Swayze yeah. behind Ben, like holding on the desk full of vases. <laughs> That's, that's great. That's My genius. Discord, they're a bunch of clowns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Q eighty. You, you guys have them too. <laughs> we do. Uh, Radial traversal pattern. Though. Yeah. Yeah. That so, is... the, the the idea that it's that that you can pick, like, say the designer mm. decides on a size of something of one one or two aspects of the object. From there, they gain their unit of measure, right? From that's what I mm -hmm. that's what I saw because if you had a vase of a different size, you're not mm. using all the same size circles. It's based on that radian of, right. of whatever size. It's a ratio. Yes, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So your unit of measure is per item that you're making. Yeah. So yeah, definitely the base unit of measure that we figured out on this one vase isn't the same as, as the what base you might find the on others, the other. But the right. the but, the yeah the the ratio is consistent if you take yes. one unit of measure at a certain length and you use that in one vase it's consistent across all the all the uh radii yeah and then so you go to a different base it can it, be a different length of unit but that is the base unit for that item that's right so, so what what we found is is a is a fixed ratio between the curvatures and then yes. there's lots of other Items, but that's, that's what across I'm multiple about. vases, we have found the same fixed ratio right. between the curvatures. But, but so, the, for example, on, yeah, all I'm saying is that the base unit is different. Yeah, but yeah. the ratio is oh, the same. I, yeah, I think so. Well, and we, we're look where we where we and we can talk about the base unit as we th as Mark thinks he might have discovered on the OG vase, the one that is in your desk on front of you there, the the model, and I've got like five or six of them up here. Um. Yeah, so that base unit, if that's how you calculate it, that, that that would not be the same unit of measure that we might find on different vases. Right. Yes, that, that's right. It, and, may, because, it reminds me because of the it cubit. scales. Yes, it reminds me of the cubit. They found multiple different cubits. Mm -hmm. And some, it's like, if I have this right, I could be wrong about this, but I seem to remember them looking for, like, what is the base unit of measurement? in like say a pyramid or multiple pyramids and they keep finding yeah. like different sized cubits. Yeah. Right. But the yeah. division within that the cubit ratio is, is the same. same. So to me, yeah. it seems consistent that like they didn't have, or they didn't necessarily need or utilize a single base system of measurement. They used a base system of ratios. But so my yes. question then is, can you, can you have a, uh, like a big manufacturing base that can build all the machines you need with all these tiny tolerances to build these vases out of hard stones without mm. a s fixed measuring system. Well, I would think that it, well, just like the vases, it would be per tool. Per tool. 
right? Like, so if I think you... they had a measuring system. I do think they had a measuring system. They must have had a measuring system. Now, I don't know that the measuring system is necessarily encoded in the vases, but I think that the basis for their mathematics and their design is what we're seeing encoded in the vases. Yeah, I agree with I, that. It, because we use, look, we, you can, that, that ratio would exist between the curvatures of uh, the vases in any system of mathematics that you wanted to apply to it because the ra ratios don't shift, right? You can, right, yeah. <laughs> bananas or, you know, imperial metric or whatever, it, it's, it's kind of it, it's it, it's it's done irres, irrespective of of the system of measurement, and they must have had a system of measurement because we know that when you uh, we know that the vases are very very accurately represent what is the mathematical design behind them. So if you take the pure if you and this is one of the experiments that Mark did that I think is a real telling point about these vases is that once he discovered this fixed ratio. You know the, the 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 radial traversal pattern, which is square root of six over two to the power of n, and then n scales up and down. Yeah. Right, and that's that gives you your your base, your circle sizes, and and on on that original vase, you've got something like eleven or twelve uh, different curvatures that range from forty two millimeters to one point one millimeter. Right, that's the radius of the curvatures. One point one millimeters. Like, good luck drawing that shit by hand, by the way. But they but there's at least 12 degrees of mathematical interrelationship because you have 12 different curves that all fit that that exact ratio pattern yeah up and down that scale and that's primarily what that vase is made of almost exclusively and the only exceptions to that are, are other significant ratios that have to do with pi and phi and we can talk about those in a minute but one once you once you you he recognized that pattern and then he so he then used that pattern to create a a mathematical model Went into CAD, said, "I'm all right. I'm going to just purely use the math that I've discovered in this vase, and I'm going to create a mathematical model of it based on the math, the math only." And he creates a model on it, and then he compares the scan of the original vase to the mathematical model that he's created, and the median radial deviation is something like six six microns or less so it's like three or four microns so you're within you're basically within the tolerance of the scan like we don't know at that point whether that's an inaccuracy in yeah. the in the scan or it's damage on the artifact it's basically perfect and you have a lot of with that's the median deviation you have yeah. you have plenty of measurements where you less it's better or, than that or, or yeah right. less or worse. that's the that's the median and so it's like the vase is a very accurate representation of this mathematical design. Um, so yes, they, they must have been measuring this stuff pretty accurately because because that's yeah. Obviously so I that's understand your point. It out. It, yeah, yeah. It, it it shows pretty clearly that they had a system, a unit of measure, a base unit of measurement. Yeah, yeah. they had a system. Is of it measurement for this. is it discernible by measuring multiple of the vases? Like, do you think it can be uh, yeah. uncovered? Yeah, the well, difference between the scales yeah. of yeah. the maybe. I mean, so we we just we have yet to do enough analysis to get to that point. So, for example, and I can walk you through this if you want me to look at the slides. It's a probably a good way to show. Sure. Uh, let me quickly try and do that, and so it's probably a good way to show the the shit the, because I the, yeah. Um... So while you're trying to pull that up, I'm just saying because yeah, go ahead. because of. The reason I'm interested in this is if they had a system of measure, it's another way you can look at the accuracy that they were working to. So if we can say, okay, here's the math that defines these vases. It seems to define them every time. It may be adjusted a little bit based on what basic shape they wanted, if they wanted the more round ones, if they wanted the tall ones. But basically, here's the math. And then if we can define also, and then you can compare the actual objects themselves or the scans of the objects to the mathematical model and you can say wow mm. look at the accuracy here but then we can if we can discern a unit of measure and be like okay this is this is the this is the system that they were using then we can also check it against that yeah and get another yeah. another dimension of accuracy right like yeah. they're they were doing this to this specific length and yeah. they achieved that length every time you know or mm -hmm. within these tolerances so, well, we, we're, yeah we're certainly seeing the commonality in the ratios um, not only in the ratios between curvatures matching this radial traversal pattern, but also the the encoding of of pi and phi and yeah. like geometric and 
uh, I guess, geometric constants in terms of pi, and then phi being kind of a universal constant, right? It's the golden ratio. It's in everything. I don't think it's an accident when that sort of stuff gets encoded. Right. But so we we did, Mark did, Mark Vist and his analysis on, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, unsigned.io article. If people haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend checking it out. He did an abstraction. If you type in unsigned.io abstractions in Granite, you'll find the article that Mark wrote. He put in more than 100 hours of 100 hours of analysis into this model as a result of the public open sourcing of the model. This is one of the great benefits of actually getting this stuff out there to to everybody. And he found just some inc- – he just – look, he blew my mind. He blew a lot of people's minds, the people that understood what his analysis is. And I finally kind of understood exactly what he was getting to because he did finally get to what he thought was the base unit of measure for this vase. Because when you ultimately, and again, it's, it is speculation, but when you look at the, at the other, at the dimensions of the vase in terms of these, this base unit of measure that he calculated, it, it, it vastly simplifies these ratios. So you end up Mm. with, you know, radii and diameters of different, of, of specific features of the vase being like, this is pi base units of measures this is phi base units of measures this is phi squared base units of measure this is pi over phi squared base units of measure so these significant ratios just pop out at you when you look at it through this lens of this one particular base unit of measure which also happened to be a really interesting number because it's 18.739 millimeters it's like like the it's uh, the wavelength yeah it's 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 the wavelength of ever it's the wavelength of a 16 gigahertz uh, 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 radio like electromagnetic wave. It's yeah. a, in a vacuum, specifically sixteen gigahertz. What, like it, exactly. What's significant about sixteen gigahertz? Wait. Well, it's it, this could be a, it just a pure um, coincidence, but it, well, but it it does happen to be sixteen gigahertz exactly like sixteen point zero. So it's sixteen gigahertz exactly, and we we use that that range of um of community it's a microwave range that we use for satellite communications today like it's it's a very it's like the it's it's like a, it's a it seems to be pretty accurate like there's there's a lot of room for movement in outside of like 16.0 gigahertz you know what i'm saying like yeah i don't know what the significance so of it is but it, it ma- exactly matches 16 gigahertz the wavelength of a 16 gigahertz electromagnetic wave traveling in a vacuum the speed of light, right? So that 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 requires you know the speed of light that you know about the electromagnetic right. spectrum, and that was that was the yeah. next question. Well, I, was I mean, gonna... if if they had because how I mean, like I don't know, that one's tough for me to to within two microns. That's tough because yeah, hertz <laughs> is uh, you know oscillations per second, and so like nowadays right. we're we're measuring a second by like we're calibrating it to um, what is it? orbital cesium atom yeah yeah so, I, well so it's look, like it's th- this is what i'm saying it's an, it's an electromagnetic wave and you're right you, you're right 16 gigahertz is because the electromagnetic the hertz measurement is arbitrary this yeah, is what i'm saying the electromagnetic spectrum anywhere i mean it, it's it's a it's a spectrum it's analog so it, right. it, a wave right. can be any link can be any, right any, and, and we at, are arbitrarily deciding detail, what's a round like, number yeah yeah we're so arbitrarily deciding what's a round number yeah i get you yeah I get you. Yeah. Well, it's just it's look. It's I, I've never claimed that it means anything other than it's just an interesting fact that it happens to match almost exactly a but sixteen gigahertz. Well, payment. the length of it is based on a second, right? I mean, a second is a is a geo definable uh, length of time. It is. Yeah. yeah. Seconds. Seconds, and our our time our time measurement does go back some distance, and it is all related to. Yeah, Cosmic but I mean to 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 define the second fine enough to measure sixteen gigahertz uh, yeah. wavelength <laughs> requires a little bit more pre- precision than like yeah gazing yeah at the looking stars, at shadows right? like, on the on that's the that's what ground. I'm saying yeah. like we're we're talking about yeah. like measuring like the the I don't know however they do it now with it. it's like it's the vibrations of a cesium atom yeah. inside of the yeah yeah something like that well so I think I, I think what yeah, yeah, I'm just saying. But I, okay, it. I mean, but, it's but, it's yeah. just it's just a coincidence. Well, I'm, uh, I'm just saying, like this is this is this is what you have to do. You have to say, okay, if this is the if this is the system they're using, what is required to know this system? Right. I was going to ask the same thing about the math, right? Like, we're you know we're constantly told about you know that that higher math is not developed until more recently. But if these guys are doing 
uh, some of this math, and it was, and they're doing it in 9,000 BC. Right. I'm not saying that they didn't have it. I'm just trying <laughs> to say, like, the, the first thing that came to mind when it comes to like saying the wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum. We'll come back to this. Yeah. Is is that it's an analog spectrum, so it can you can choose any wavelength. Like you could just say, here's the base you. unit of measure. There is a electromagnetic wave that is that length exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Yeah, that's right. Right. So, um, that's why I asked what's what's the significance of 16 gigahertz. There's now hertz is a, hertz yeah. is is waves per second. So then, the only way to actually know that is to very very precisely define the second, and yeah. we have done that in a certain way. So that's just kind of the way I'm I'm you know it's like what does this actually mean? Yeah, it's an arbitrary like the round, what is a round number in, in an analog spectrum? Like we don't know. Like the, I I get it, and it could be it could just be an analogy. I actually think the most important the the more interesting thing about this base unit of measure on this vase is the fact that it it encodes and shows up all of the pi and phi and significant ratios of the of the artifact itself like that's yeah i think that's more interesting once once you define you and you go okay based and it's that 16 gigahertz thing's got nothing to do it's literally it's like hey this just so happens to yeah to equal I, this. i get that too it's, but there's like a there's a several equivalencies that show up that this is a very particular and important ratio which is the the radius of the internal opening uh, which is essentially what's get what gets used as the base unit of measure on this vase. And when you look at the other elements of the vase, like the diameter of the opening or the radius of the uh, or the diameter of the neck or the radius of the foot or all these other things, you you start to see these significant ratios appear, which is like, okay, this is pi base units of measure. This is phi base units of measures, phi squared, et cetera. Yes. Like there's all these different combinations of pi and phi that I don't think you, you can't, you can't claim that this is accidental. Like this seems to be designed in. You can find pi and phi in, you know, in in some things in in nature or in in an artwork. But when you you get to an artifact like this, where you have twelve or twelve degrees of mathematical interrelationship between all the ratios of all the curvatures based on that radial traversal pattern, and you've got dozens and dozens of significant ratios appearing that that show up in you know using geometrical constants like pi and and universal constants like phi it it stretches credulity to suggest that that's accidental i mean it's it literally completely impossible i think at some point i mean mark in his article says that you know it'd be far more likely for you to wake up one morning and have an entirely new universe a quantum universe sprouting out of your left nostril than it would be for um for this to be an accidental just designed because some dude was rubbing on it with rocks and sand and ended up with this, <laughs> with ended up with this device, which is, you know, I, I think honestly, when the discussion gets to this level about these, these artifacts, I think it's like, we've moved the needle yeah. at that point, right? Because <laughs> we're, we're no that. longer talking about, you got to always keep that in mind. Like literally they're explained we're by guys about... banging on them with rocks and sticks and sand. Yes. Well, I mean, and come on. Yeah. You know, Real quick, before is, are you looking up the gigahertz thing? Yeah. Okay. Real quick, before we go back to that, <laughs> He's fascinated by uh, it. I'll, one I one idea, <laughs> one idea is that like like if you had a tool set, so the tool maker is the one you using the radial transversal pattern, right? The tool yeah. set is a series of um, radii, mm -hmm. and the way they step up in size is by this pattern. So then the guy making the vase only has to design certain elements. This this would be an interesting experiment. Yeah. If you set up if you had a set of tools for your um for your lathe mm. that were sized up according to this radial transversal pattern. And you came up with then then what would your design uh options be if you're like okay well i want the mouth to be this big and then i'm gonna then i'm gonna cut this edge and then cut that edge so it would be interesting to see like how many different designs would you get this sort of pi and phi ratios represented in various ways so that you see what i'm saying yeah because I, no well, not, so not not yeah and some of the stuff that shows pi and phi does not conform to the radial traversal pattern so those are intentionally made into because it, they I, even i think because they show pi and phi yes yeah 
So that's that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Is it like how yeah. difficult is that if you if you start out with this set of tools and then you have to like come up with a design and you're trying well, to share, I don't know. It's like Yeah. Well, so one of the other points Mark makes about this is that when you when you look at the design and what it would take to design this vase, and given that there are curvatures as small as one point one yeah. millimeter radii. <laughs> Uh, that it this this starts to like you can't do that by hand scaling it up and down yeah, yeah. so you can scale it up sure You're not you draw can it make in a sand. piece yep piece of paper as big as the room you're sitting in you might be able to draw it you still got to scale that thing down yeah. and, and figure yeah. out <laughs> and let's not forget that it's been accurately represented to within a few microns that design was executed in granite right yeah that's very that's the, accurately that's amazing to me so there's there's you get to this point of okay so how do you it turns out that the best way to actually represent that vase is mathematically. Yeah. So it's with formula. It's not with. It's not by like a drawing or a, a large reference drawing scaled thing. down or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You can't. You can't draw it down that size. You, even you can't get the curvatures down it's that vector. size. So it's done mathematically. And now, <laughs> the trick that Matt, that Mark gets to is like you need to, there's, we don't know of any other way of transferring like a mathematical design or a design like that to it to an, a manufacturing system something that produces lathe operating outputs and you know it's like there's no other mechanism or phenomena or animal or process or anything that we know of in our entire history as the human race and, and all of our combined knowledge that does that except the one thing that we call a turing machine yeah yeah, which a is a is a <laughs> a device that can basically take data, you know, and 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 operate on that data and based on a set of pre preset conditions, like change its state, and then then that drives a, a specific output. Like there's a An that requires a Turing output. machine, and yeah, yeah. what it could be analog, could be digital. Like you you can make these things pneumatically or hydraulically or um, mechanically. No, I, yeah. We I'm do meaning, it electronically, but. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, going from computers. mathematics to an actual like physical motion to an output, yeah. right, right. So that's the other part that's interesting. It's like that's like it's there's a, there seems to be a Turing machine involved in this process somewhere, and and it's and it's logically if you follow the design process and the and what we see as the output, um, it's hard to deny that. Like it's, I did get I get a lot of flag on the, the comments on that video are hilarious because I did I did a video called like was an ancient were ancient computers used to design this vase? Yeah. It's not clickbait because that's exactly where it goes. And now yeah. I'm not suggesting it was a IBM laptop, you know, <laughs> it could have, I don't know, but it, yeah. but, but it, it might've been some other like, you know, mechanical or, or what is it? The, um, what's the antikythera mechanism? Yeah. Antikythera mechanism. Who knows? Like yeah. there's obviously some mechanical sophistication going on in the past. We've seen that. And it's quite possible that some of this stuff could have been done. It's still a fairly sophisticated Turing machine. It's not something that's not like a simple, you know, couple different transistors or yeah. pneumatic transistors or something. It's 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 more complicated than that. But um, it may not have been electronic. There's lots of other ways of potentially solving that problem. But it does require, as far as we know, that the only way you can achieve this if you are working from a design, as indeed it seems like that's the case with this vase, you, that a Turing machine has to be involved in it. And now we're, again, I remind everyone we're leaps and bounds beyond butt flap wearing dudes rubbing on s stones with right. sticks and rocks, you know? That's what's like, been, come on. that's what's been so fascinating <laughs> about watching this process is you go from the people like, well, they, they did it with rocks and a stick. And then they're like, oh, you can easily do this on a lathe, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, and, and then uh, we're like, well, I mean, maybe, we, we. you know, maybe you need a five axis something or other. And, well, I mean, yeah, you yeah. kind of uh. need a computer to sort of translate it into a yeah. five axis machine. Yeah, we didn't even talk about the thing that you raised at the very point, at the very start, which is like the area between the vase handles. Yeah. Which is, yes, it is. It All the analysis, and we did this in Danville, we tested this on a few vases. Yes, it shows the same level of precision as does the rest of the vase which makes it very yeah it challenging takes, to takes explain how out. you can do yeah. that it does <laughs> it cuts yeah. the lathe out of the out of the question well it gives you two options it, it either says that well it's a five axis machine so it's made in a single pass mm -hmm. or like like one machine does it yeah which is like a five axis mill or the process that made this could handle the lack of like positional calibration yeah and tool changes better than we can because today when we do stuff like this where you have to put it in a different process with a different tool, 
it introduces errors that you see in the final result and we account for that in our design processes. And this is something that these actual metrologists and literal rocket engineers and you know jet engine people yeah <laughs> that are working yeah. on this stuff have have drilled into me like i don't work in that field but they tell me yeah like this is we account for that stuff in our work like we know that when we have to do, take it take this piece to a different machine to do a different process it's going to not be as accurate relative to the other stuff yeah and we account for that but that's not what we see on these vases which is really fascinating yeah Wow. All right. What's up with the gigahertz? Well, I'm just the reason. I mean, yeah, you're just laughing at me for, but I no, I'm not the, laughing at this you. This is just... the, the well, it's it's a deserved laugher. But okay. this is the thing. Like <laughs> I find through you know, and I'm sure you guys know this, like studying this stuff for a long time, that these people, that that whoever this was that designed these kind of things, they always had multiple lines of connection to the. Like, if, let's say you find some specific number in their measuring system or in an object or whatever. You find that it's connected in five different ways to six other things, right, in terms of numbers. And so I'm just like, I'm interested in, in – and so if you if if it's possible that they this 16 gigahertz wavelength is, is in here on purpose. Is it significant? Yeah, is it purposeful? And if we don't know what the significance is, that could lead to new discoveries. Right. Right? Like, why were they connecting it to it? Because that's, it's going to connect to five other things. That's what I was asking. What's the significance of? Well, I'm just gigahertz? so I just looked it up. Like, what are we looking at here? And uh, so I've got physics.phi.astr.gsu.edu. Okay, and so they have this short, the, this website, nothing but text, talking about all these different bands under microwaves and radar, which the frequencies are 1.6 to 30 gigahertz. So the 16 is in there. They say in interactions with matter. Microwave radiation primarily acts to produce molecular rotation and torsion. And microwave absorption manifests itself by heat. Molecular structure information can be obtained from the analysis of molecular rotational spectra. Uh, the most precise way to determine bond lengths and angles of molecules. Microwave radiation is also used in electron spin <laughs> resonance spectroscopy. Okay. So now you're talking about... You so know, they're, me they're measuring the second. Yeah, <laughs> you can you can measure molecules with it. It spins them, or as a result was, of spinning molecules. There was something I need to talk to Alex and Nick and figure this out again. I, and I'm going to completely ham fist my way through this. But there was something about the speed of a hydrogen atom that seemed related to this that they were excited about that That's... I didn't grok. I didn't grok from. Mark's report, but they did, and and I, I need to find out specifically what they were worked up about. That's what I thought when, when I was, they came to that. That's why I was looking this up because I remembered this idea. So this there there was this idea with SETI, the search for extraterrestrial tra t intelligence, that one of the one of the bands that you want to study when you're looking for signals from space is this specific one that has to do with hydrogen. Um, yeah. yeah. Let me see if I can find out what that is. Hydrogen frequency. Yeah, that might be it. And that, I know, I remember Alex and Nick talking about that a while back. Damn. Yeah, I'm getting those guys. They're definitely going to do more podcasts. <laughs> I want them to do some more yeah. talking, and they're going to do some conferences and stuff. I, I know Alex is interested in um, getting out in front of this and doing more uh, of the public-facing stuff, which I would be very happy for him to do because he's the expert on this stuff. Uh, I can't find a simple answer to this. Let's see. Is that, uh, yeah, 1.4 billion hertz. So that's not the same. Not yeah. the same, yeah. So anyway, it's just interesting, like, if if this frequency has some other significance, and maybe we don't even know what it is, but I find that these people, you know, I it just seems interesting to me that the measurements and the systems the rate the the ratios and stuff that you find in objects like this are always pointing at other things they connect to yeah. each other in multiple ways and i you know i i i, I go There's back to that the, going on yeah i go back to the question also like what is the level of math we're talking about here you know we're, we're now so we're discussing like did they have computers <laughs> like what kind of machinery what the what precision did they have to have in their manufacturing process to have an end result of objects that are this precise and imprecise materials but then, the, you know, but another question that goes along with that is what is their, what's their 
corresponding abstract level of precision. You know, like what was their, what was the level of their math? It must well, have been very high. Like, what's the level of their ability yeah. to make a measurement system? That's why I was interested in a base measuring system because, like, the accuracy of your ability to check against a measuring system you have is reflected in objects that you make. That's right. Yeah, and it seems like though, if you know, we, I think we've just discovered the mathematical principles behind the vase, and they and they certainly very accurately represented those yeah. in the artifacts themselves, such that we could figure off first of all figure out what they were and then actually make a measurement and say how close did you get and yeah. it turns out they got really damn <laughs> really close, close. So, yeah yeah in materials well, in, in materials that materials that are difficult, very difficult. yeah they're <laughs> yeah, not like they're the, non the worst fucking materials yeah yeah the <laughs> dumbest materials that you could frankly try to do that shit right. in but the, it it happens to be the material that's going to last the longest as well like right you make these things out of steel or metal or any other Anything else, really, it's not going to last as have. long. I mean, they may have. Made well, they a lot may have. Well, that's right. Well, the antikythera mechanism. This is what's interesting about things like. I mean, not that I'm comparing the antikythera mechanism to this, but it's a great example. I mean, just metal, like the really, it's stupid that the only reason we have that thing is because it was on the bottom of the ocean, yeah, being degraded by salt water. Like it would have disappeared eventually, but we found it, and there's clearly evidence that there were probably lots of these things, but the ones that were on land that were found, I mean, metal just gets taken. It either it oxidizes, it erodes, or people take it and cast it into whatever yes. tool they want for because it's so damn precious. Right. I keep trying to tell people that. I was, where are the tools? I'm like, we don't, you can't, you could fit all of the metal that they found, uh, discount gold and silver, which are really no yeah. good for tools and weapons, but you, you take the actual metals that are useful. In yeah, ancient Egypt, you tie it fit under the whole the end of your spear, dude. <laughs> golden metal, golden you find, no, yeah. you find that tool tip, <laughs> exactly. Sharp tool yeah. tip, oh, you oh, bro. I'm sharpen it up, I'm yeah. this it. on the end of my stick, yeah, exactly. And and that's what happened to it. It either yeah. got it got turned, it got used, it got melted, it got taken because it's precious. And you, it, it's so little of it that's been found. You could fit all of the stuff from ancient Egypt over all the years and all the digs and everything into pretty much a small room. All of the metal stuff they've actually found, right. And again, discounting gold and silver because they found pounds and pounds of that shit. But right. no good for tools. Oh, it's, it's decorative. It, there's a pile of it under Nimrit, bro. Yeah, <laughs> it may well be, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, I, I, I want to get a, into there. The hall of records like, under there that no us. one has entered. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. The dudes died trying to get in there. So what? Let's try again. That was yeah. the '60s. Let's go again. <laughs> <That's right. You laughs> <know>? <laughs> All right, break time. All right. All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, Uncharted X, a Swapcast, actually. Uh, so we are joined by yep. Ben. We've been talking uh, ancient precision, vases. Uh, so you pulled up a graphic earlier. Let's let's take a quick look at that. I know we went through cool. some of it already, but I'd like to take a look at that and get into the details. And then we can we can discuss some other stuff about Egypt. We can't. But let's, uh, let's take a look. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. And if I move this, is it going to blow it up? Was that work? Yeah, it still? doesn't change anything. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. So, so what we were looking at, this is kind of relates back to what we were saying before about um, these significant ratios and their mathematical system. Like we know that, you know, at a minimum, it, it it involved concepts like pi, phi, even even the radian. And in fact, I'll back it up one just to talk about the radian because they also used the concept of the radian quite elegantly in this vase. And we've seen it in other vases too. And and if people don't know what a radian is, it's a, it's a simple way of measuring angles on a circle. That's a much more elegant way than, than our sort of 360 degrees. It's if, and you can see the graphic here, if you, if you can't yeah. see it, I'll describe it. It's you take the radius of a circle, you apply the length of that radius to the circum to the circumference of the circle and then the, the the angle that that makes, so if you sort of cut that pie shape out of a circle, that that angle in the center is one radian, right? Yeah. So so you have, you know, one radian, two radians, three radians, and then it's pi radians is half a circle. So 3.1416 um, radians is, is exactly half a circle. And then there are two pi radians 
in a full circle in terms of degrees. So, but this one radian arc is, is a, you know, it's, again, it's a geometric principle that relates to things like pi and, and just basic geometry. And we see it reflected in the design of the vases. They use the one radian arc quite extensively in this, in this particular vase. They use it to describe the angle of the, the top part of the vase, the actual angle of the, uh, you know, the, the, the sides of the vase relative to the, um, the circles that that the the maximum internal diameter the the circles of life or the flower of life patterns that we that mark originally started with on this vase they're also the one radian arc is also used to describe the location of the handles relative to the other geometric features on the vase um it just plays into it it's it's just an example of um i guess other geometric principles that are encoded in the vase and we actually see this on other vases too like there's yeah I can tell you like the spinner vase or the very thin vase has has the use of, you know, one third of a radiant arcs and there's one radiant arcs and some of the other ones as well. Um, and we could back up and talk about kind of the the circle of life. And it was it was the dis- the discovery of these interrelated sacred geometric patterns that that led to the discovery of the radial traversal pattern and that ratio between the curvatures. So it basically started with the looking at the circles of the maximum internal diameter and the maximum external diameter of the vase, and then creating these circle of life patterns based on those, where those circles were. And we found that those patterns described a lot of the other features of the vase, the top of the vase, the bottom of the vase, the foot of the vase, and the relationship between those two size circles. So the maximum internal diameter, the maximum external diameter happened to be the square root of six over two, right? That was the that was the relationship, and and so from using that, then they they took that ratio and looked at the other curvatures and found actually this is this is a this is the same ratio that we see reflected up and down all of the other curvatures just to the to the power of n, like so so right. <clears throat> minus one, minus two, or three, four, whatever it is, up and down the um uh, the different curvatures, but. The other thing that's encoded in the vase, and these these are the other curvatures, these significant diameters or significant sort of features of the vase that don't match that radial traversal pattern. They seem to be there, and they also reflect pretty significant um, ratios in terms of pi and phi. So pi being you know three point one four. This how many times the circumference of a circle goes into its, um, or oh, sorry, the diameter of a circle goes into its circumference, and then the golden ratio. Which is uh, what is it? One point six one eight or yeah, one point etc. Yep, yep. Uh, and that's the golden ratio encoded in nature, the Fibonacci sequence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like this is a fundamental of nature, and I mean Randall does a great job explaining this, and it, it's encoded in everything in nature, from molecules and DNA to you know the spiral formation of galaxies and everything in between. We see this encoded in these elements in the vase. So, for example, if you take the d zero here, so the the, the basically the, the the straight red line, the diameter of the of the outer lip at the top of the vase, over the radius of the internal opening or ri, the, the straight blue line, you get pi, mm. and you get pi to within zero point one percent, which in you know real terms and real measurements on the vases is, is around thirty two microns. So, uh, you know thirty two picometers or microns. So. Very accurately, so within 0.1 of a percent, you, this is this ratio of do to ri is pi. Uh, similarly, we see phi squared when we look at the diameter of the neck dn. This straight line on the on the right hand um, diameter, yeah, which is the diameter of the neck uh, compared again to the ratio of, or sorry, the radius of the internal opening. Uh, we get phi squared, and we get phi squared to within 0.07 of a percent, so around 20 micron. Uh, so very accurately, we're seeing these significant ratios appear. Uh, we also see it when we look at the foot of the vase. So again, if you look at the diameter of the opening, which is that that same, uh, what we saw in, on this first one, that, that straight red line, the diameter of the out, sorry, the outer lip, yeah. DO is the outer lip, not the inner lip, the outer lip. And we can and we put that over the radius of the foot. We also get phi squared within 0.08 of a percent, or around 35 um, 
micron on the actual vase. And what's interesting about these is that you're actually, these are ratios and measurements that are on two completely separate ends of the vase, right? So it's, yeah, it's remarkably accurate given that these are features that are as far apart from each other as, as, as they can, as they can be. So because we've, we've got pi and phi in, in both of these, and we've also talked about the diameter of the outer lip in terms of pi in that first equation, we actually get this double equivalence. We have two ways of expressing uh, the diameter of the outer lip, right? So it's it's this double equivalence. So we we can we can actually express the radius of the foot in a different measurement, yeah. In terms of pi, and not just uh, we can do it in terms of pi and in terms of phi. So the radius of the foot now equals the radius of the internal opening times pi over phi squared. This is this double equivalency because we we're seeing pi and phi in both of these measurements. And what's interesting in this, and in fact, I don't know if I can do, is this going to, does it, does this follow on your screen? You see this? Yeah. Yep. You see in the, uh, I base guess the, um, revealed. yeah, base unit revealed. I almost want to see the, the, um, kind of the, uh, I guess the step through of the animations here. So through pi and phi and this double equivalence of, of the radius of the outer opening, we can connect all four measures. So the diameter of the, of the outer lip, the diameter of the neck, the radius of the, internal opening and the radius of the foot and it, it looks complex but it's actually pretty pretty simple when you when you step through it so it's it's the same measurements we just went through um where is it here why is it not showing up here damn it sorry i see what you my mean other yeah. version of slides it goes through it so but yeah i'll step through it so the diameter of the outer lip equals the radius of the internal opening times, times pi, pi yeah. and the tilde is and the diameter of the neck these are the same things we went through before equals the radius of the internal opening times pi squared or phi squared and the radius of the foot. And this is that double equivalency measure we we measured we, we mentioned before. That equals the radius of the internal opening times pi over phi squared. So something that's in all of these you might notice is Ri. Yeah. So the radius of the internal opening. So we can now say, let's assume that the radius of the internal opening equals one. Yeah. Now, if the radius of the internal opening equals one, we can simplify these equations such that the diameter of the outer lip equals pi, because we're taking out. We just just yeah. basically replace R i with one, one times pi. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's one times pi. The diameter of the neck equals phi squared because it's one times phi squared, and the radius of the foot equals pi over phi squared. So this, these ratios appear. So therefore, we can assume that the radius of the internal opening equals one that's and that's how mark got to this idea that this might be the base unit of measure for the vase and that is as we discussed before 18.739 millimeters which also equals the wavelength of an electromagnetic wave at 16 gigahertz to within two microns so it's 18.737 if you divide the speed of light by 16 gigahertz in it well speed of light in a vacuum by 16 gigahertz you get 18.737 millimeters which is two micron or two thousandths of a millimeter off that 18.739. Now, if you followed the math, you probably already realized this bit, but it's interesting to then look at the rest of the vase through the lens of that base unit of measure. And these elegant, significant ratios start to appear when you do that. Now, obviously, the opening radius of the neck is one, right? The unit is one because yeah. that is the yeah. ratio, that is the, the measure we're using that equals 18.74 millimeters. Uh, but you get down to things like this, where it's the max lip diameter or the outer lip diameter, that's pi base units. The minimum neck diameter is phi squared base units. The foot radius is pi over phi squared base units. So this is, this, that's kind of the logic that he used to get to what might be the uh, base unit of measure for this vase, because these aren't accidental. I don't think this just pops up accidentally. Right. That you have these significant ratios relative to one of the main measurements on the vase itself. And what what's interesting um, since this happened, and this was the result of kind of the initial uh, analysis effort on this one vase, and this is what's really encouraging to me, is that Mark and there's other there's other researchers also involved in this effort now on the mathematical side. The process is now automated. So there's they've written some computer programs where you can put in the measurements of the vases and it will show you 
significant ratio. So it, it will actually compare everything to everything and, and pump out a list of what are the significant ratios. And it's something that we could actually apply this to any, if you, I do want to, and I do want to do this experiment at some point, take a household object. Let's take a regular coffee cup or something and just see like, okay, can we see the same type of significant ratios appearing in regular artifacts? I don't think we will. I don't think it's going to be anything like what we see on these vases. Cause people say that that's one of the arguments yes. against these vases. Oh, you know, you see pie and fire and everything. You can just look at stars in the sky or the, you can, this stuff's just like made up math. Right. And I just don't, I don't think that's true. Like, and particularly, it, I, I definitely don't think it's true when it comes to the, the ratios and the curvatures and the radial traversal pattern. But I also don't think it's true when it comes to pi and phi and these significant ratios and these other features. And now that we've got an automated process, if we scan some other artifacts and we get measurements on them, we can actually run it through this process and see. Um, and that's part of the work that's going to be going on right now. And what's really super interesting is that we're only talking about the one vase at this point, but we've seen the same things in other vases. And that's been a huge step forward for this whole project is that not only are we seeing the radial traversal pattern, the exact same ratio between curvatures in multiple vases that we, that have been scanned and analyzed. We're also seeing these significant pi and phi um, ratios in, in, in the main features of these vases. Right. It's the same thing. Like it's it's just not accidental, right? Like, it's like you said, in the, you said in your video, it's like it's not a unicorn, right? It's uh, it's not a unicorn, yeah. right? Yeah, hundred percent. I I have heard this same thing. If, I mean, you this same argument from I don't know if you could even say skeptics, just people who it's like they don't want to accept that this is an important thing yeah. that happens. Like when you study some ancient object, and you're like, wait a minute, look at all these very interesting mathematical ratios whether you're looking at it in the great pyramid itself because people have found tons of them in that you know yeah. like wow if pi and phi are represented in a million different ways in all the structures inside the pyramid and all that you know and people are like well you know you can find those same uh relationships in a, in a kitchen stool if it's well made you know and i'm like so we'll, say, we'll do yeah. it that's right do it. Get a freaking stool and show me, like, oh yeah, look here, here's pi and phi, and and like here's pi over, you know, phi squared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to see the same thing. I mean, I'm yeah. in the same boat. People say that. Yeah. Well, and, okay. And, look, here's and the you problem. can find phi. You can find fine things, but I challenge you to find twelve or thirteen degrees of mathematical interrelationships. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah, the, but the it's, it's the way they're all connected. Stuff. Yes. No one's. Yeah, exactly. No one's going to even try this on like a natural cedar wood stool because they're definitely not precise like most most like artistic objects are not precision they don't have like bilateral symmetry they don't you're, you're not it's not difficult to to find where it's not square or not round yeah, yeah. most sure. pieces of art actually kind of they're it's almost well, they're intentionally organic. a little bit organic. But you'll see phi in that. You will see know, the golden ratio in that. My yeah. point is it, it is that you're not you're not looking for accuracy in mathematical representations in right. most handmade uh works of art. Right. Because there there's no reason to do that. Like yeah. people yeah. okay, so people have done this with like you know da vinci's paintings and stuff like that where they're like look sh look at the look at these angles you know the, yeah. and it's but it's so roughly done it's like the position of the guy he's down here and his arm is going up and then if you kind of look and then there's a, a lamp up there and it's just like kind of like well he's sort of th everything is positioned in the room in this beautiful sort of phi mm. ratio spiral and that's yeah. fine but it's not accurate it's right. it is very arbitrary yeah, yeah. When you're talking about yeah. the radius of a circle down to the micron level, right, right, you wouldn't even try story. to do that on a normal handmade piece of art. No, I know. Yeah, that's the it that's is, the key it is here. A, it doesn't even yeah. compare because you can get okay. measurements to this precision level, and then right. find pi to a high degree of accuracy, which you're not going to find in some hand painting. I agree. But yeah. I, I would yeah, like and, to know, and, and, like, is the is the rough radius 
of the top of a stool, you know, in some pi over phi ratio to the radius of one of the legs. You know, I mean, I like, yeah, that would be, I would be love fun to, to know this. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can scan and find out. We now have. <laughs> We now have applications written where we're, if we can scan the artifact or scan anything, we can put in the significant measurements of that object. Yeah. It'll figure it out for us. Like nice. it, it'll do that. So, you I've know, it's, it's interesting. Good... You talked about, you talked about the pyramids. I just, I want to make a point about the, the vases. Sorry. I have, I'm going to change I, I have topics some great briefly. So go ahead. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I got this beer <laughs> can. <laughs> we can measure this and we can measure yeah. the lip and we can see. <laughs> yeah. Beer can would be a good measurement. Did yeah. Lone Star. Yeah. Put mathematical measurements into their beer. Lone, <laughs> Lone Star onto something, bro. <laughs> okay. Drinking the correct Sorry. beer for Texas. That's good. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say pyramids. That, that pyramids and the vases. Yeah. So, well, it was a recent discovery for me, like a connection at least. Was it? So, I was at CPAC, uh, speaking at the CPAC conference, and Robert Grant was speaking at the CPAC conference too. And Robert was doing, has done some new work in terms of, Analyze, and I'm going to ham fist this, but I want to make the connection because this was this blew me away. And this again came from the audience, like this it came a, from a commenter. This is a precision conversation, man. You can't just <laughs> it is. hand fist yeah. this. <laughs> I will ham fist it. And we'll, we will, I will reserve my right to correct what I say later. How about that? But, um, well, so he has done a bunch of new research into look into this looking at the specific slope angles of all of the different pyramids and indeed things like the ratio of sort of length to width of the Giza plateau. And he's mapped all of those things and found that they correspond to the harmonic scale, like the F sharp ish, like the, the yeah. harmonic scale in terms of ratios and measurements. And that the different pyramids represent these things on the harmonic scale and what's interesting is that i've once we posted the radial traversal pattern i had a commenter talk about the fact that these the square root of six over two to the power of three four or five whatever also matches this exact same kind of harmonic scale so it's it's i think it's an interesting perspective i, I want to test it and and we're looking into it to see if that holds water, but what's interesting to me is it seems to it, it is a potential connection between the mathematics of design. Yeah. So the mathematical design between things like the pyramids and the vases could be connected through these these elements. And it's just it was an interesting connection. And I, I have yet to speak to I mean it was really bizarre because I spoke to Robert about it. I mean I met him, I didn't know who he was. We were up looking at a telescope in the hotel in Palm Springs, and I was like, "Oh, he was speaking. I'm speaking." I'd never seen the guy. I never heard of the guy. I don't watch TV. I don't watch Gaia. Um, I should probably shouldn't say that, but I don't really <laughs> watch a lot of other stuff. But I didn't know who he was. But I, we were talking. I was telling him what I was doing. Then he told me what he was doing. Then I watched his presentation. I'm like, man, there's a lot of synchronicity here between the, these ratios and what we're talking about. And then afterwards, after I talked to him, I, I we po I posted that video when I was in Egypt, and that would somebody put me onto this fact about the radial traversal pattern matching the acoustic scale. And I was like, shit, that's, yeah, that's very interesting relative to this work. So it's, that's an angle that I want to try and pursue and figure out, but it's just interesting. Um, yeah. And you know, it's like this, point. whenever I hear this kind of stuff, it, 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 it strikes me that, you know, we have these words or these sayings that uh, like, you know, living in harmony Right. Mm. This, this idea of like being in harmony or the as above, so below. And I think of this and I'm like, is there something there? Right. Is this is like, I don't know why the word is being used, but does this idea come from some very ancient concept, you know, or even a sort of a yeah. like, like a quant suff of this concept, you know, that there's this harmony and these objects are made in it. Yeah. all the way up to the, the the pyramids themselves and the angles and the math and there's like there's a, a kind of harmonic happening what is it harmonizing it, with yeah well nature i don't know it's like yeah. it, it's yeah, it's the universe thinking. it's it, it, the, this whole i mean the fact that i don't think it's accidental that you have things these universal constants encoded in these artifacts i don't think it can be i just i just i think it's it, it's a communication it's like it it's telling you they understood these things and it and and that's a, that's a deep understanding of the nature of reality in the yeah. universe and just you know i'm just 
it blows me away that, that people think it could be just accidental or whatever. I, I, yeah, I don't think it is. I think it's, it's pretty clear indication of, of sophistication and, and knowledge and, um, and yeah, harmony with nature. I mean, yeah. that's they're, they're based. They literally have a more harmonious math. I'd look at it as, and I think there's a more harmonious sort of mathematical system at play here. Like one that is, is more tightly, entrenched with these principles than our own system was like it's not you know these are like more fundamental base units for them like these these particular ratios and these these constants that were using them and they built their system around them versus you know we measure them and we express them in our units of measurement but i think they were i think a little bit more tightly coupled to it that's what it seems like to me and yeah. it's just like a fundamental piece of everything they did so if the radius of this this object the radius of the outer lip on the top here is is one in oh, the internal opening the radius of the internal oh opening. is it the but internal yeah. okay i thought yeah. it was the external okay you're right so it's the internal the yeah. radius that's that's r equals one yep for this object and then if you apply that same concept to the other vases are you getting similar like no. simplifications no uh, not, well, not, not, not the length, not that but measurement. The, not yeah. the length, but the but the same principle. I don't know. Okay, we don't know yet. I don't. I haven't done the. Me I don't think we've done the analysis yet to see if that same thing holds true for other phases. Okay, it, it's very. It's one of the many things that are on the list of things that it may well, have been done already. I just I haven't talked with the the guys doing that stuff in a yeah. couple of weeks now. But I can tell you for sure that the uh, the radius of the base. Of that pointed one is not going to match. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, the radius of the foot of that pointy one is not going to match. I agree. Yeah. Right. But well, I guess the question I'm really asking <laughs> is, you know, is is there some base length in the right. other vases that will be that you could say, yeah. ah, this, this is, is the one. one. I have the same. This is the I one the, for this vase. Dude, yeah. I have the same question. That's yeah. what I was thinking. And yeah. then my, you I know, mean, there's, there's, and then the next yeah. question is, is if we can define a bunch of those where you're like, okay, here's this vase, here's this one, here's this one, and we found the one for each one, one of these. Then you compare those. Compare them, and then can we find out maybe what their unit of measure was, right? Yeah. Yeah, so there's two. There's, there's, there's the two ones that we've looked at and that have been as astonishing as that main one, if not even more. There's two of them, and this, this one, the very thin. Oh, yeah, look at that. Very thin-lipped. Uh, this is like the, the side walls are between two and four millimeters. Wow. In fact, I can feel the, 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 the groove that's around the inside of this, but this is the translucent one. So it shows the radial traversal pattern. It shows the one radian angle. It shows a bunch of different features just like the other one. And in fact, there's, there's been some geometric reports done on these. I haven't done videos on them specifically yet but i have i have i did include a little bit about them in the in the the video from danville where we were we actually had the original versions of these and we were measuring them and put them on you know row tabs and we had vases on them uh sorry dial indicators on them yeah and then the other one was this one the the, the, the spinner, spinner vase yeah God, the cute. spinner's amazing i i'm hard pressed to pick a favorite between these actually i like the thin one just because it's so delicate and it's amazing that it survived this long this one's a bit more solid it has more heft to it but it spins incredibly well. If you've seen the video, it just spins and spins and spins. And and what's so interesting about this is that you want to talk about the same sort of relationships that we see in the other vase. Okay, this thing is full of the radial traversal pattern, as is the other, as is this one. But what's interesting about this is the geometry of why it spins. So it's it's actually see, it's like oh yeah, I remember this. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's like the it's it's like this fat little squat looking thing but but it turns out that the base and the way this is defined the the width of it it's actually three circles of the exact same radius the same size slightly offset from each other so you have one that sticks out on this side one that sticks out on this side one that sticks out just a tiny bit on the bottom, on the bottom. in fact it only sticks out like one less just less than a millimeter and it's that the tip that it forms with that geometric shape that is what lets it spin. So it's this tiny, less than a millimeter tip that that of these circles that sticks out, and that's what it sits on and spins perfectly uh, on the bottom. And it turns out that these circles also have a relationship to the height of the vase. That's it's exactly I think it's phi or it's phi squared, but it it has the exact same. So these significant measurements yeah. of the vase are, are encoded in this thing too. Like it's. 
not an accident. And, and a, this thing's so precisely made that you literally sit there and spin it like the, the granite version. It's quite heavy. It just spins and spins and spins. Yeah. In the video, they it's, put it down on the table and he spins it and it just, he's watching it. It just spins and keeps going. It slows down very slowly. And just it's keeps on a granite going. table. Yeah. yeah. It's like a granite <laughs> vase on a granite table. And even this thing will spin. Like even this plastic one is, is it's made pretty well. I mean, nothing like, yeah. to the accuracy of the the scan limit the or anything original, but you can yeah. spin this even the plastic ones will spin in fact i've got a back channel with the with nick and alex and they've got a bunch of these and they're like spinning them and knocking them into each other and stuff the plastic you know the, 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 <laughs> the 3d version ones, yeah yeah it's yeah, astonishing to me about that one that it that it sits so perfectly upright it it doesn't oh it's, yeah it's not like yeah. it's not overbalanced it's not on rolling side. over to yeah. the side of one of the no, leg I mean, handles or something you know it's just that is do you see the picture i took of it like the, I have to show it to you here. Well, well, the people that are actually going to watch this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you something. Yeah, makes me uh, want to get a potter's wheel. Like I just want to get a potter's <laughs> wheel and start making some, some pots. I mean, <laughs> this guy, he, this is it here, right? Like, yeah, that's awesome. Just, just there you go. Like yeah, that's, like, <laughs> like fuck off. <laughs> just insane. Like yeah, like yeah, that's what it's sitting on, and it's just perfectly balanced on that, and that's on a, that's on a granite surface plate a surface table that's like you know point four of a thousandth yeah it's like an a like rating four, four tenths of a thousandth that's flat yeah. so yeah it's not being held and on the anything fact it's, that just... it's just like look at the top look at how level the top is it's just beautifully i mean yeah well yeah i mean there's any number of things to talk about with these bloody vases that i mean the fact that the tops are flat and you can use them as a reference surface. You can you can mount them on a rotab based on the flat top. Like we, with this one, we just spun it around, and sat it on its top. Because you can measure that the top so flat that it doesn't it doesn't give you like this run out. If if it wasn't flat, you wouldn't be able to measure the the you know it would it would deviate when yes. it rotates. It yeah. would wobble. But the tops and the bottoms of these things are so flat that it do, it doesn't affect it. It's like they're within a thou. Also, of of being perfectly flat, these surfaces. So you can mount, you can literally use the top and the bottom as a as a datum, like as a reference point, yeah. and then you just mount them based on that, and you're good. Um, it's within the tolerance of kind of the rest of the gear, like the the, the rotab. The rotab itself has a run out of about a thou. So I saw that. Yeah, it, it's got a little yeah. devi tiny deviation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So yeah, actually, and that's what I liked about that day. I was really happy I went out there that, for that, and it was um. You know, it's a. I think it's a. I, I'd like to think it's a realistic sort of nuts and bolts version of precision. Like it's not this esoteric. Like oh, we're doing this computer simulation analysis of a of a three D model in software on you know on, yeah. a, no, you on had, a mainframe or whatever. And you were mounting them in, like, in in actual yeah. tools and like putting dials yeah. on them and, and dials on spinning them, right. them and like watching the dial move. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It was yeah. cool. It was an analog. You still get people that go like, "Oh, it's not precise. Look at that dial; it's jumping all over the place." Like it's <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it's jumping like point. <laughs> Those five. are in thousandths or <laughs> half of a thousandth of an inch. Yes. So it's it's okay, bro. Yeah, <laughs> you stick a hair in there; it's going to jump quite away. You know, like. Right. You stick anything that isn't precise in there. It's just going to like go and stop. And that's the <laughs> other thing is like these are five, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand years old. You know, like how yeah. how precise were they when they came off of the manufacturing floor? Right. Yeah. And they, and a lot of them have visual damage and, and visible damage. And yeah. there's a couple that we couldn't actually measure because of damage. Um you know, that's, yeah, we don't know how old they are. Like, they could be that old. They could be way older. It's, it's, it's a, it's a miracle. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying is that the precision remains. That's right. And, but what we're, what we're measuring is very ancient precision. So you don't even know yeah. how much precision has been lost because it doesn't take that, even on a granite object, it doesn't take a whole yeah. lot of rubbing against sand to lose a half of a yeah. thousandth of an inch on one part of it. That's right. Yeah. Again, uh, not all of these things are are precise like we they're remember that right. giant i mean that massive chunker down in underneath the step pyramid and we were like rolled yeah, yeah. it over it's like it's part of the Stunk. part yeah. of the lip of the the vase and then this big round yeah, yeah. piece of the side i mean that thing is just it's a monster it's probably two inches thick or more heavy yeah. heavy big chunk of what was a massive i mean how did you turn that thing i don't think that one if it was whole, would show the precision level. Probably not of these others. I don't know. It might, but I'm just saying it's like damaged either way. It's heavily damaged, but 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 yeah, 
I, I do make that point. Not everything is is that precise. That's right. And that's not what we said. In fact, we measured a couple that were in order. Of, we have a couple of different vases. Um, this one. Let me grab it. So this one is like um, no lug handles, but granite. I think it was granite or basalt. An order of magnitude worse. So where something's like two or three thousandths, you're talking 20 or 30 or 40 thousandths out mm. on this. Sometimes your um, bearings are getting old. Sometimes <laughs> I don't know. your bearings I just, I are look, wallowed out a bit. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, think a lo- I think there's, and I've been, it's something that I've been paying much more close attention to in the last couple of years in museums and stuff. And I have a lot of pictures even the last trip to Egypt, I was I was taking I take a lot of attention at at where what is obviously handmade because there are handmade hardstone artifacts like yes. there are handmade vases and stuff and you can see, I mean you can obviously see the see the ones that are really rough, but they probably they probably also put some effort into a few that 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 you could just look at it and go I can't really tell and you probably wouldn't be able to tell until you measured it but yeah there's some handmade stuff that's probably reasonably good but I don't think it's within you know, anywhere, anywhere close to the precision of, of the actual precise objects, of which I think there are many, by the way, lots of the stuff in the museums. And we, and also a lot of the vases that we measured that are in the collections that we have access to right now are very precise that you, I don't think you can explain it. Most of them with, um, but, with anything other than machine, you yeah. know, machining. But the point but, is too, is that look, yeah, our modern tools today, we have very high precision lathes. And then we have low precision lathes. Yep. yep. We have bearings that are not as good. The tools are not as rigid. And then the other factor is when your cutting tools get dull, you lose precision. Mm-hmm. You know, so, I mean, there's a lot of different factors that go into getting the precision. Even if you have the capability and the technology, you're not always going to get it. Right. No, I agree, and and we know they make mistakes too. You make yeah. mistakes. Um, your bearings. We see that out. all over the place. You, you get you get a deviation in in some aspect of of the of the machine. Yeah, you're not going to get the precision. So, I wouldn't expect yeah. them all to be the same, but it is. No. It's like Dunn says. It's like we have to explain the, the hardest, most yeah. difficult yeah. aspects. The most. That's that's right. Yeah. We do have to explain the most difficult aspect, and the fact that we found so many of what I would term the exceptional ver- exceptional class yeah. of of artifacts within a collection of maybe twenty <laughs> that we've looked at so far. Um, right. That means that you can't explain the exceptional stuff by saying it was an accident yeah. or a unicorn, right? right. Yeah. yeah, or it's or it's a fake or whatever. It, right. I mean, the other ones have better provenance and all. That. Yeah, we dealt with the provenance, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. It's, it's, there's a spectrum of them a hundred percent. Then we know that, that there was definitely mistakes were made. I mean, we have the unfinished box in the museum. We have yep. overcuts on all sorts of stuff on obelisks on statues. We have overcuts on the, the box in the King's chamber. We got, we got, you know, we were looking at in the break, we were looking at some of the Serapian boxes that have, uh, not necessarily mistakes. It's it's like were they were they mistakes or were they working with the stone and they were dealing with imperfections in the natural material that they were working with is another whole another part of this. But yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not. It's not perfect. Perfect. I still get but the. It's, idea. it's still way beyond. My point is, that, you know, and everyone's. I think our point is that it's beyond. Yeah, it's beyond. Hand, it's beyond people, dudes banging on them with rocks and sticks <laughs> and yes, sand. It's definitely past that at this we point. Can, that's the point. Like, but, if, if if we can admit that, then I'm like, all right. Yeah. Next. <laughs> we've moved. Yes. We've next, moved next, mystery. next mystery. <laughs> next mystery. Next mystery. I still, I still <laughs> get the idea that uh, that they were kind of in a hurry. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, know, it's sort of like a you, haunting thought. Yes, because there's like overcuts and like you just get the idea like they're like we've got to get this done. And, yeah. and and then they make these mistakes where the saw gets off and they're like, okay, just throw it to the side. It's still, it is it isn't like they got rid of it, right? It was found, yeah. so it's like they're mis- they make mistakes. You just toss it to the side. You keep cutting because you're trying um, to finish this job before you run out of time. Fucking comet lands. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, yeah one thing it, we're it, not precise unfinished. on is. Uh, Taking our breaks. Timing. <laughs> yeah. We have a low precision on this, but it is break time. All right. Yeah.
And we're back, ladies and gentlemen, for the final segment of the fastest face talk in the history of podcasting. <laughs> oh, I love hour and forty five minutes of faces. Yes, not enough. That old. Still haven't figured it out. Yeah. I I I freaking love this stuff, man. It's it's great feeling like you know we're we're pushing forward here. I agree. With yes. This. It's it should change the conversation. Um. Is there, uh, you You kind of, I think you kind of hinted, that, this is my final question on this topic, but you kind of hinted at this, I think, in your in your latest video, but is there a possibility of getting actual museum pieces to do some of these scans on? Yes. Is that being worked on, yeah? Yes. The answer is yes. Uh, we are uh, on a couple of different fronts, actually. Um, so Chris Dunn has a, concept that i'm a big fan of and what and that is that you know he's he he thinks that and he's been saying this and certainly it's a part of his new book which is coming out i can highly recommend it i've read it mm. um uh the you know the uh giza the tesla connection comes out i think january february uh one of the things that he talks about is that it's time for the egyptians themselves and the engineers in egypt to kind of take control of some of the heritage and mm. i think because in a lot of ways their own hist like the Egyptian the history of Egypt and this this picture we have of what is ancient Egypt is is one that to some extent has been dictated to them by external mm. groups the British the yeah, Americans yeah. the Germans the French yep you know the Egyptologists as they've stood and then you know Egypt has a chance here to to really redefine their own history and take control of it. And I'm happy to say that there's been some progress made on that front because it's Egyptian engineers who have already been involved with Egypt's uh, with with museums in Egypt, um, and they're doing they've done some things in the past, like you know, like just scanning artifacts with lidar for like you know 3D tours where where you can look at like oh here's a 3D scan of an artifact and spin it round in a virtual tour or whatever, and it's not particularly accurate. It's like lidar scanning that you get on an iPhone or you know, a, a handheld LiDAR device that's, it's not super accurate, like a structured light scanner, but they're doing that process already. Like they've put these objects on tables and they're lighting it and they're spinning it and they're creating models on it. So we've been having some conversations with a few of the universities and the people that are involved in those efforts already and have relationships with the museums and they're engineers and they're very interested in the results that are coming out of the project so far. Mm. So they, we, we're trying to leverage that and they are making inroads to like work with these museums to say, well, let's go back in with structured light scanners. Let's get actual scans. Let's get these, you know, thousands, thousands, thousands of an inch or even better resolution scans. And then we can put them out and analyze them and figure out some more things. So that's happening. It's a slow process, but it is happening. And I, you know, I do think we need to get as part of this, we want to get Egypt, Egyptologists on board. I, I think Egyptologists should be interested in this. It at, at the end of the day, it's you know we are going to learn more about the manufacture of these artifacts. Um, at the end of the day, you are doing also digital preservation of these artifacts. Yeah, this is a big selling point. Like this is, and th I know this is also a push with some of these museums. It's like we, we're we're literally digitally preserving these artifacts forever as long as there's a digital record of them if if god forbid something happens to one of these things you have a digital record of it that is very very accurate so you you, you have a record of it um so that's that's i think that's a benefit if if nothing else just the fact that you get this digital preservation of these artifacts um that's a benefit and then you know, I've been trying to, and and as I said before, I had some conversations with the British Museum, uh, and I'm also working with the Petrie Museum to try and get in there. It's just a matter of time, I think, uh, until we can get in there. I know the Petrie Museum does allow this type of work. They're a research museum. Uh, they've certainly seemed willing in my engagement with them so far. I was there earlier this year, and really strangely, and I mean, I think honestly just a coincidence, but they happened to be closed for renovation for exactly the two or three weeks that I was in, oh. the period that I was in oh. the UK. <laughs> Unbelievable. I actually have pictures of standing out the front of the Petri Museum. And I emailed them back and forth about trying to get in outside of that, and I had some friends who knew them as well that you know, just couldn't do it. But uh, I'm gonna, definitely going to go back and, and book research appointments, and, and they've certainly seemed willing to work with us to 
and they've got a lot of artifacts, not only not not just vases and plates and stuff that Petrie's worked on, but also the like drill cores. Yeah. I, I want to scan, scan and drill cores, I know Alex yeah. Dunn's really interested in scanning the drill core. Like Petrie's core number seven is the main one that everyone's looked at. But if you go through their archives and you look at their collection, they've got a whole bunch of drill cores. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of them, just at least from the photographs, look like they have the same type of deep spiral groove that Petrie's core number seven does. And I, I would love to to scan those because I think we can get. I mean, I think it's. I think that mystery's been solved as far as Petrie's core number seven goes. That was solved with the latex core and or the latex mold and the other work that's done there. But I, I think there's certainly. Um, more cores we could look at and, and I think analyze using these <laughs> techniques, but long story short. Yeah. A long story long. It, it's <laughs> yes. Yes. We're working with museums and I want to, and I, I, I very much hope that if we get into a couple of museums and we can do this work, that that will open the door for the bigger yeah uh, museums, you know, the Met, the big museums in the U S like maybe one day the Cairo museum, I don't know. Like that's I, I would love. That's like that's like the ultimate dream. The ultimate is, goal, yeah, yeah. What's in the car museum? Because God damn, they've got a lot of interesting stuff in there, <laughs> right? And this, well, this is the other thing. If the grand new grand museum would ever open, like supposedly yeah. they're going to have a whole bunch of artifacts that haven't seen the light of day. They've been in a basement yeah. for a hundred years, yeah. Uh, and that would that may open up entirely new lines of inquiry on yeah. on some of this stuff. Like who knows I, what they've got. I can't wait to get in there, man. I'm hoping they're in there when we're in there and we're there I in know. February I and, know. and in March. But yeah. February and March, we're going to be in Egypt. And uh, Well, Yusuf, I, Yusuf basically destroyed my hopes because well, last time we <laughs> talked to him, he was like, I doubt it. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're now saying the end of this year, they're saying something like January, February. I mean, they've said this, this since is 2020. What been saying. <laughs> yeah. I know. I mean, Trust me, I know. One I, of these times, it'll be the right. The, it'll be true. Yeah, but it just hasn't well, been, been true yet. I've been saying it on the tours that I've been doing since 2020. I did one in 2020, 2021, 2022, <laughs> and then this year. And I was just like, if it's open, we'll go. And yeah. like, we're gonna go because they said it's open, and it's never been open. And so now I'm just like, look, we're going to the Egyptian Museum. Yeah. If the new museum's open, we're going. We will definitely go. Yeah. And if it's open. Now, I, I can't tell you, is it going to be open? I don't know. But because <laughs> they've been saying they're going to be fucking open since 2020. And, yeah. And they're not. So, I mean, I know why, right? They're, they're, they're looking for the right moment and they just haven't had it with COVID and then this, yeah. this other nonsense that's happening in the region that's unfortunately affecting the, uh, the region. Yes. Which I will tell you, I was just in Egypt, like I literally came back, what, a week and a half ago. I was there for two, three weeks, three weeks pretty much um, in uh, October and November. Wonderful. I mean, it was great. I had a great time. It's still full of tourists. It's it's dropped down and like there's been a small drop in, in, tourists, in tourism, which is good for us because the sites aren't quite as busy. I, I, I often describe it as it's gone from 105% to to about 92% mm. of capacity. So uh there's that's that's good. Um but yeah, it was great. I mean, we had a great time and and we're doing it uh, we're doing it again in February and then also March because yeah. February sold out. Right. February is sold out. We couldn't do our extension to Lebanon, so we are right. opening up a second tour. We are. So, yeah, gonna, it's going to be great. Yeah. We're doing basically a carbon copy of the February tour. About ten or eleven days after the uh, February tour ends, and that will be, uh, we've only just decided to do that because, like as Russ said, we, you know, we uh, couldn't do the. I uh, mean, Lebanon's, you know, a yeah. bridge too far. These uh, with this this current issue, but I mean, Egypt's fine. Like right. Egypt's the Egypt's fine. This, and uh, Egypt's absolutely fine. I I, and we, yeah, like there's no issue with uh, with going to Egypt, and. Uh, we will. Uh, we decided. We thought. Well, do we do another extension instead of Lebanon? We go to Egypt, and we're like, you know what? And then I was talking to Mo, and he's. That I mean our Egypt trip in February sold out so quickly. I was I was blown away by how quickly it's. I didn't expect it to sell. I thought it might sell out, but I didn't think it would sell out in like a week, a which week. is what it did. <laughs> yeah, it was unbelievable. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit! And then a lot of people were like, man, I can't get on. 
There's like more than a hundred. There's more than 150 people on a wait list. Yep. They're like, oh, hopefully somebody cancels, and then. So we're like, well, let's not do an extension. Let's actually just do another trip and try to give uh, a few of these other people on the wait list the chance to go. So that's what we did. We we decided we'll just do a repeat of the same trip. Um, same deal, same everything, and um, we're going to make that available to people on the wait list and patrons and stuff here for about a week or so, and then we'll we'll put the details out publicly. But yeah. Real easy way to, uh, if you want to hear about it, then just register for the first trip and get on the wait list and you'll, <laughs> yeah. you'll get the email about the next trip. I get guess. on the wait so, list and you yeah, get on the wait list get and early get access the, next, to the second next trip. day or two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> easy. Yep. But uh, yeah, it's going to be fun, man. We'll be in Egypt for a while, but it's um, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. We'll get out to the desert and do some other things in between. Be yes. nice. And hey, if you're going on the first trip, yeah, it's not enough. Yeah, sign up for the, for the second trip one. also <laughs> yeah yeah i'll tell you what i mean i was just in egypt and we did i mean i went i always like to go and have a fair bit of time around the trip where i'm not on the trip and i can yeah. do stuff outside of the what is the i guess the set itinerary and then yusuf and mo we go and do stuff and, and this last trip we went out to like the western desert for a few days and it was just wonderful like we went we found we went to a bunch of sites that I've never seen before that are just off the beaten track. You've got to get in four wheel drives and stuff to get to like some old kingdom, like literally like structures like the Valley temple that are out there in the Fayum. Wow. Giant megalithic structures that are just vastly ancient and nobody's barely ever seen them. And it's like this Valley temple just sitting out there in the, you know, in the, That's in the, crazy. on these Hills near the, the bottom uh, on the, on the Western side of Lake Moiris and the Fayum region. <clears throat> And we went out to the Valley of the Whales, and I, yeah. I'd love to. I want to get you guys oh out there God, at some point yeah. too. We did the Valley of the Whales, which was just astonishing. I'm pissed Spent off some about time that. In the I told you about that, and you went out there. Before I didn't I know got... we were. Yeah, no. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> we'll get you there. I'll get you there. That was Mo and Yusuf, not me. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I mean, yeah, that's that. Can't wait to drag see me that out place. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally worth it. It's good fun, and. uh yeah, there's all I'm saying. You know, the point is that Egypt has a lot to offer. Um, yeah, you know, and, and then obviously there's the Red Sea and the the nice vacationy side of it as well. That's good for if people want to spend time and they go diving or whatever it is on the Red Sea or the Mediterranean. I mean, it has all of that as well. So there you go. Egypt is cool, man. It is. I'm looking it forward is. to it. Yeah, it's going to be yeah, amazing. Can't wait. All right. Well, we're we're about out of time here. Shall we wrap it up with some space weather? Let's do it. Okay. I can't reach my button. <laughs> wow. There it is. <laughs> space weather news from spaceweather.com, ladies and gentlemen. Spectacular canyon of fire eruption. A dark filament of magnetism erupted from the sun yesterday, uh, carving a deep canyon of fire in the sun's atmosphere. Updated forecast models suggest that a CME flung into space by the filament could graze Earth's magnetic field on November 25th. Minor wow. G1 class geomagnetic storms are possible when this CME arrives. Current conditions solar wind is 481.0 kilometers per second. The density is a low 1.35 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number right now is 174. Ooh, that's way up from the last time we looked at it. Mm. Oh, and, dear. And uh, <laughs> the neutron count is minus 2.8% of the space age average. That's a very low reading. KP index is 2.33. Where's the bell? Yeah. And the 24-hour max was 4.33. <laughs> it's hard to, hard to reach the bell when it's on the other side of the Necronomicon here. Yeah. That is your space weather news for the week. Thank you guys. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for supporting the show. I hope you all uh, appreciated the uh, the Gobekli Tepe video. We are going to be making yeah. more content like that. Oh, yeah. Um, That's amazingly well done, by the way. I just want to say that. That's, thank you. I love that video. Thank yeah. you so much. Like like I said in the video, you're, you're a huge inspiration and you've helped us out thank you. a lot on that. And of course, we've been traveling with you. So, you know. But yeah, yeah, big uh, thanks, bro. Yeah, much thanks yeah, for that, for that. Likewise. Yeah, thanks for um, ruining my weekends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys were like low effort, no video. I'm like, do some video, <laughs> right? Do some video. Now you're doing video podcasts, right? Now you're doing produced videos. Yeah, 
Yes. <laughs> I the should never have let him YouTube. meet you. You know, this is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> You're a terrible influence, Ben. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. I, uh, yeah. I yeah. It, it, was, you guys, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, the great thing about doing it is is it, you really have you really absorb the material of the stuff that yep. you're putting that making the video on you know it's like you, you we've found like we've gone on other people's shows and like we can really talk about that about gobekli tepe and that site yeah. and the way and all the research that's done because you have to study it and to write the script yeah. and you know so it's it's actually really helpful so it's yeah, great so, i mean I, yeah. yeah i fucking i love that video it's it's like i learned stuff watching it like i i you guys did the reading i can tell that like i learned stuff take away i took stuff away from it like i i've been saying some of those same things but yeah. i didn't have the background that you guys obviously had with the like i know the carbon dating comes from the walls and that like there's multiple periods of burial here and it's not and the, the people are saying that maybe it wasn't specifically deliberately buried now i think yeah. it's, it's super interesting yeah then yeah. the devil's in the details with these things it is. There's, it there's is. many of them and yeah you guys teased that out in that one. I thought it was fantastic. So. Awesome, dude. Thank you very much. Thank well you. Done. All right. Well, we're wrapping it up. Yeah. Yep. Let's okay. wrap it up. Well, thanks for coming on, Ben. We really appreciate it. Really do yes, appreciate indeed. it. I demand yeah, a NASCAR man. race <laughs> next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. We'll do that. Like, I, I like the NASCAR race. That was fun. You guys were kicking butt. We did a little bit of sim racing before this. Yes, yeah. we did. Yes, bringing the boys into the racing league. This yeah, is we are going to be interesting. Love it. We are. Yeah, we're, we're streaming it. I stream it live. I, I stream on Twitch. You guys streamed it live. We too streamed on Twitch. it. Yes, we did. Yeah, you guys need to check out Snake Bros Twitch. If you're not, <laughs> if you're not uh, following it, follow it. It's good. <laughs> did terrible until NASCAR, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm gonna bone up we're on at, that. We're so. we're gonna practice on you this. Guys first time in, first time in. This, yeah. Sim racing's a curve, bro. There's there's, there's no. Yeah. <laughs> there's a learning curve. You get there. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, all right, Ben. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Thanks, and, guys. Uh, looking forward to uh, all the stuff coming up. Yep. Hell yeah. And uh, thanks to everybody for supporting the show. Also, make sure you go to Ben's channel. Ben, tell them where they can find you. I'm sure everyone knows. It's but... unchartedx.com on YouTube. Uh, the channel is unchartedx, and all my social medias and stuff are on both of those things. You'll find them beneath the videos, and uh, I occasionally post on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, and all that fun stuff too. But unchartedx.com. And you, you occasionally do. You stream to Twitch of your, like, I do your, stream your on video Twitch, creating yes. process, your research, going yep. through video, all your pictures and stuff, so like people can join That's that. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah twitch.tv slash UnchartedX. I do stream two or three times a week. People like it. I mean, it's very casual. Yeah. Uh, we, I'm, I'm doing footage review. Like We've been looking at all the stuff that, from my recent Egypt trip recently, and then, yeah, I'm making videos, and I'm doing the the, the grunt work, I guess, the, if you're interested in how the sausage is made. and uh, interacting with me and, and talking and asking questions and we do tons of that so i, I yeah. do two three times a week it's it's a good time good all community right. there you go awesome all right Thanks. folks thank you guys we love you always have always will good night Adamu. get back to work mm -hmm.